Hello everybody. How are you? Uh yeah, sorry I'm late. I um I basically got it wrong and I, I thought that the stream was at three. It was in my calendar as as three PM BST. So I was like I was only on YouTube by chance and then I was like I saw thirty five people like waiting and I was like fucking hell, they're waiting quite early and then I looked at the chat and people were like, Is this actually happening? Then I realised I got it wrong. Anyway, I'm here now. Uh, which also means I'm slightly unprepared. Um, for one second. I wanted to read, because I didn't actually... I wanted to read this... Um, this N Noah Smith post about um, renewables versus carbon taxes. Hey, thanks for the follow. Thank you for the follow. Hello, Tear. I'm not sure about this, this daddy thing. I'm not, <laughs> it's really, it's starting to creep me out a bit. Why are, why are renewable subsidies are better than carbon taxes? Now, the problem here Oh, more followers. I should probably put headphones on, but I can't be bothered. I'll just turn it down. So, okay, so this is behind a paywall. Can we use archive? I think somebody gave me a PDF of this. Let me see if I can get that up. Um, I, I feel a little bit bad on on Noah because you know he's a he's a fellow content creator and I'm. Uh, bypassing his paywalls but I don't feel that bad because he's Noah Smith um, I'm pretty sure somebody yeah here we are okay yeah somebody gave me like the PDF Uh, what? That, I mean, that's just not, right, okay, just let me, what? Oh, jeez, okay. This is what happens when the stream starts an hour before I thought it would. Um, right, let me just faff for a bit. What? All right, here it is. Here it is. Why did that download and then like not open? All right, so let's start with this. By all accounts, this is a good, uh, this is a good blog post, unlike, um, unlike a lot of his other ones. So, <laughs> uh, Could be worse, yeah, I mean, yeah, could be worse. This is a super interesting topic, Swift, um, he. Um, I think, yeah, so I've got a few papers to read. I think um, if you're all, you know, trying to provide me with links and stuff, Bear in mind that I think Twitch allows you to send links, whereas YouTube doesn't, which um, kind of, I don't know, it's, it's annoying, but you know, it is, it is what it is. So you might want to switch to Twitch if you're planning on sending like links. So I mean, my, I should say before I start reading this article, what my view going in is, which is that I discovered in a previous stream on this because I'm not an environmental economist right I and I you know that I can understand the logic logic of carbon taxes um I can also understand the logic of of maybe of renewable subsidies um I think if you take like some of the most basic economic models they'd almost be equivalent but obviously we know things are much more messy in in the real world 
so all that is to say that I would have just supported both and just been like, let's throw what we can at it. But I didn't have much of a nuanced opinion on the matter. Um, but when when I looked into carbon taxes, I was really, really shocked by how thin the evidence base for them is. And you can, I mean, you can look this up. Um, you can look the other stream up if you if you didn't have a look at it and if you want to. And I did also, uh, yeah, I got, I made this like little thing about just like, I mean, it's really short, right? Like we just, we just read like a few papers and only two of them were really worth, um, only two of them were really worth putting on here. Uh, but yeah, like, the, the, so this Anderson paper in 2019 says the carbon, the literature on carbon taxes and carbon pricing has been indecisive on the question of whether taxes reduce emissions substantially, despite mainstream economists' characteristic certainty on the question. So if you look at polls of economists or whatever, there will be like carbon tax. Like, I think climate change is real. We should have a carbon tax. And that's just like basically what they advocate. If it's someone like Nicholas Stern, who's obviously a bit more uh, clued up and a bit more radical, I suppose you could call him. He'll he'll probably say more than carbon taxes, but I'd say a carbon tax is the default position. However, it's just like it, there's just not that much evidence for it. Um, not enough to justify that degree of certainty. And partly that's partly just because carbon taxes have been really rare, right? So you know, I'm okay with taking a leap of faith every once in a while, but I just um, you could have got the impression that there was a strong evidence base behind them from listening to economists and i just don't they, they just isn't right uh so he does find that there's an um a big effect of them but it's in sweden only and it's only a transport based carbon tax there are exemptions and this is one of the issues with carbon taxes in practice they tend to be quite tricky you know there's there's a lot of exemptions and industry lobbying and things like that Um, and this Hytes, height, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but that this paper also um, says that there's there's not that much evidence behind carbon taxes and is, is pretty uncertain. So, yeah, it says we should view them as a components of a portfolio of mitigation policies. Very, very finance brain, but Hytes. So, I think... Uh, Thanks for following stretch marks. Why is that? Is that? Uh, answer me a question, everybody. When somebody follows me, do you get that sound playing? Wait. Okay, okay, okay. No, that, that was like, for me, that was really long after the... That was really long after the thing appeared. Mate, my Streamlabs thing is fucked. All right. Well, as long as it's working for you, I don't really care. Oh my good god, you all replied then, didn't you? Okay. Right, let's go. Is this fourteen pages long? I mean, it's big writing in it. Jeez. Right. Okay. Okay. YouTube voice. YouTube voice. I need more water. Good take from Inet. We'll uh, we'll take a look at that. That might be the same one I have saved, or I have the paper version of that saved. Dig Digabert. The Inflation Reduction Act is first and foremost about creating abundance, about lowering the cost of living for the average American. It also just so happens to be the most significant piece of climate legislation in US history. Climate wonks are overjoyed, and rightly so. But the IRA didn't approach climate change the way most climate economists wanted it to. For decades, climate economists have focused rather obsessively on the idea of carbon taxes. While democratic politicians were talking about investment and green jobs and technology, Climate economists were maintaining their laser-like focus on measuring the social cost of carbon so we could design the perfectly sized tax. Bob, Co 
Cop of Rutgers. I wanted to say Klopp then because I'm a Liverpool fan. Bob Cop of Rutgers has a good thread on of soul searching about why climate economists ended up making themselves so irrelevant to climate policy and what could be done to correct course. Wait, should we take a look at this thread then? Let's take a look at this thread. Oh shit, I didn't change my uh, t my timers. One second. I want to disable this one. Okay. I don't have a current guest, so I don't want to current guest Nightbot saying things. Drawing a Keynesian diagram for it. It has supply side. Uh, it has supply side components, though, right? But it wouldn't. In traditional economics, it would very much be a case of it's just demand side. I would imagine, unless unless that your tutors are saying it's demand and supply. So, Bob Cop seems like a bit of a legend already. I might follow him. Hey, thanks for following person who I can't see because it, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the the graphic and the sound are out of whack on my uh, on my obs. Okay. Environmental economists should probably take a moment of humble reflection to ask whether the discipline's focus on first best carbon pricing mechanisms contributed to how long it has taken to get US climate legislation. Ooh, geez. Okay. So he's actually saying not just that they're wrong, but that they might have like had a negative effect on combating climate change. And if so, what the social cost of some of the intellectual habits and customs that led to this focus has been. Here's a specific example. The most transformative climate legislation of 2009 to 2010 was ARRA, and it's about $80 billion of energy investment. But unless I miss something big, the effort developing tools to project the consequences of that sort of investment paled in comparison to the effort to develop tools to project the consequences of carbon tax or cap and trade. If there were better investment-oriented models and some assessment of political economy, might there have been a decision to double down on the investment approach rather than the massive amount of energy that went into Waxman Markey? Okay, I don't know what Waxman Markey is. Also, this guy needs to not capitalize his um, the tweet when it's part of the same sentence as the as the um, previous tweet. This is the 2000, the American Clean Energy and Security Act. But it didn't, it didn't pass, presumably. Or did it pass? A cap and trade scheme would have established a variant of emissions trading. The bill was approved. With no prospect of overcoming a threatened Republican filibuster, the bill was never brought, brought to the floor of the Senate. Hmm. This would have been a proper cap capping trade on, on total greenhouse gases. I didn't know about that. I didn't know about that. Okay, so, oh, Bob. Maybe, maybe not, but it seems at least plausible enough to argue that the community should have taken a more pluralistic approach in the 1990s and 2000s. And I should add, this is not a criticism of individual researchers. If there are research questions not being asked whose answers might help advance practical policy, that's a collective problem, not an individual one. And I think there has been growing attention to these questions since the failure of Waxman Markey and perhaps also the general post-financial crisis increase in the diversity of economic thinking. But there hadn't been another legislative window until this session. Um, okay, now he starts talking about something else. So basically, okay, that wasn't that informative, that thread. or it, what, There wasn't that much analysis in it. He was just sort of talking about how, how in practice the capping trade system might not have been the best thing to 
advocate for politically, but he didn't go into much, much analysis. Thank you, Cold Alien. All right, all right. Let's continue. Except for a tax on methane emissions, the IRA employs subsidies rather than taxes. Instead of charging companies for emitting greenhouse gases, subsidies pay companies to switch to specific renewable technologies like solar power and electric vehicles. Economists tend to think carbon taxes are superior to subsidies because taxes allow companies to reduce emissions by whatever is the most efficient method – renewables, energy efficiency, simply cutting production, etc. While subsidies focus only on specific alternatives for specific pieces of the emissions puzzle. So why have climate policymakers so resolutely ignored carbon taxes and focused on subsidies instead? Part of the reason is politics. Taxes make people feel poorer, even if you pair them with cash benefits, which is why carbon tax initiatives fail at the ballot box, even in the greenest of states. Fair enough. I mean, you had like the Gilets jaunes um, protests in, in France when they increased the price of, of fuel, right? Because people use carbon. And so, you know, the, the political power of fossil fuel companies aside which is a bigger side, it's, they're still so unpopular because they're regressive, right? Um, carbon taxes are regressive. I, it's difficult. I, can't, I can link to the article. The problem is that it's behind a, a paywall um, stretch. But it depends on... Um, I think I'm allowed to send stuff, yeah. Yeah, pirates, I, I don't... I'm not... I mean, I'm, I'm not in favor of fracking uh, in general because I think it can be quite disruptive to local ecosystems and also, like, I don't want more oil and gas. Uh, I also think it will have quite minimal, quite minimal benefits. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know the details of the trust scheme, but generally speaking, fracking is environmentally directly bad in the sense of being, you know, bad for the immediate environment, but also... It's they're fossil fuels. Like why are we why is our solution fossil fuels? Um the deeper economic reason why the they they the does he mean the the IRA subsidy centric approach is better than what climate economists would have given us. Uh renewable technology subsidies are simply a better climate policy than carbon taxes, and the climate economists didn't realise this because they were asking the wrong question. A real climate problem. The Inflation Reduction Act is first and foremost about creating abundance and lowering the cost of living for the average American. It also just so happens to be the most significant... Wait, what the fuck? Is that not... Wait, why is it rep repeating? Oh, so that. Oh, wait. So there was the first. We got the first page again. The fundamental. Fa fucking hell. The fundamental fact about global warming is that it's global. Greenhouse gases contribute the same amount to climate change no matter where they're emitted, and the US re represents only around 14% of global emissions, a number that's falling every year. And no. This is not because the US outsources a bunch of our emissions to manufacturing intensive countries like China. When you look at the emissions produced by US consumption, it's just not that different. So even if a US carbon tax were applied to imports as well, it would only have only a very limited ability to curb climate change. If, even if you zeroed out US emissions completely, it would represent only a moderate reduction in the global total. But of course, realistic policies, including our Paris Agreement commitments, won't come close to zeroing us out anytime soon. A recent analysis by the Rhodium Group shows just how much of a reduction we can expect in the next decade. Is that? Oh, that's a... That's a Misleading y-axis, anybody? For God's sake, right, okay, so that's, it's going down, 
a few thousand, right? Like, I mean, it's better than anything that we've had before, but like, yeah, that makes it look like it's going down to near zero when it's not. So current policy, 24 to 35% reduction, Inflation Reduction Act, 31 to 44. Yeah. Oh, that's cool stretch marks. Um, yeah, maybe we'll talk sometime. Maybe not this time, but maybe another time soon. That would be interesting to talk to you, actually. We're already reducing emissions somewhat due to cost reductions in renewable technologies. If we met our Paris commitments by this analysis, it would result in an additional decrease of between 17 and 26 percentage points over what we can expect to achieve otherwise. Yeah, okay. The map just checking his maths. That's quite substantial, but it still represents a decrease in global emissions of only 2.4% to 3.6%. But in fact, that's just the direct effect. What would China and the rest of the world do in response to the US meeting our Paris commitments? The rest of the world emits 86% of carbon emissions and rising, so this is a really crucial question. There are basically two schools of thought here. The first is that the US exercises an, an almost magical degree of moral leadership in the world, such that if America decarbonizes, China and other countries will follow suit out of shame or out of desire to retain their international standing. This idea strikes me as extraordinarily unlikely. The US can't even get China or India to join sanctions against Russia. China is gearing up for military conflict with the US, with its officials constantly tweeting out stuff like this. Pelosi's Taiwan visit is a major provocation that upgraded US-Taiwan relations and a real threat to China's sovereignty and territorial integrity. China has to prepare itself for every possible scenario. This is not a country that thinks America is some sort of shining moral beacon it needs to emulate, and developing countries like India are concerned first and foremost with alleviating poverty. Europe, meanwhile, has been making its own decarbonisation efforts. At best, the US will be racing to catch up in that regard. Okay, so just to sum up this argument, I mean, I, I agree with what he's saying. I don't agree with quite how he said it. This is Noah Smith, by the way, Big Smoke. Uh, I, like, one, one tweet from a Chinese official. Like, imagine if you got tweets from, from Republicans. They've been gearing up for war with, like, fucking, you know, France for about 30 years, let alone China. So I, I don't think, I don't know who that person is. Um, I don't know anything about Chinese politics and I don't pretend to know anything about Chinese politics. But, you know, officials tweeting stuff, I don't think is evidence that they're gearing up for war. Um, Having said that, it's pretty, Russia is at war, uh, and we are in a way at war with Russia already. And I, you know, China has its own things to do. India has its own problems. You know, they they like he says they want to alleviate poverty. They have their own decisions to make. Thank you for following. Guess spanced zero. Um, so, so. You know, and, and Europe as well, he's right, is is separate. So, I mean, he hasn't mentioned Latin America or Africa um, or Oceania um, or the rest of Southeast Asia. But, yeah, I, I, I think the US does have an, a political influence, but I think, like, hoping that the US passes a carbon tax and then everybody else just does it, like, that seems... That that seems kind of unlikely, right? I mean, the U.S. Okay, for example, like I think things like um, there are like limits on things like animal testing, right, in, in the U.S. and in Europe, but China just does the opposite. So, you know, he's right, but he's <laughs> for the wrong reasons. People told me this article was good. <laughs> I think they just like the conclusion of it. It's not. It's not amazing. Um, a very contrarian and unsophisticated tweeter, well, yeah. A more likely scenario is that China and developing countries take advantage of US carbon taxes in order to buy cheap fossil fuels. If carbon taxes reduce US demand for oil and coal, that will decrease the prices of these things on the international markets. China and others can then buy them cheaply. 
In fact, you can see something very much like this effect at work in the markets right now. China's recession is lowering demand for oil, which is causing oil prices to fall. All else equal, that price drop will raise oil consumption in the US and all over the world, which will cancel out some of the climate impact of China's recession. Similarly, if the US imposed a carbon tax to reduce our own demand for oil and coal, the international price drop would cancel out some fraction of the positive effect. Yeah, that's true. You know, it is. I mean, this this is just the classic argument about international coordination, right? We have national sovereigns, we have some international institutions, but they're fairly ineffective at this type of thing. But so sovereigns are operate at the nation state level. Many modern global problems from economic to environmental um you know, to to um, so social problems as well, operate at, at at the international level. So it's difficult for for us to you know, us uh, us citizens of individual countries to um, enact enact effective policy because it will just either be ignored or you know, this market mechanism that he's identified where, you know, you, you implement a carbon tax in the US, then you stop uh, using carbon as much and then the price of it, like, um, you know, the price of it might go down and then, and then other people might go on to use it more. So it could cancel it out, this kind of um, negative feedback loop. Okay. There's just really not a lot you can do about this. Uh Global warming is a global externality, yet policy is made at the national level. Climate economists obsessed with salvaging the carbon tax idea have come up with Byzantine schemes for clubs of countries to use coordinated tariffs or other economic sanctions to punish countries that didn't implement their own carbon taxes. But this is basically just fantasy land. If you want to use one nation's policy to push the whole world to decarbonize, you're going to have to do better than single country carbon limitations. Know that this also applies to regulations that ban coal or fracking, etc. Fortunately, we do have a policy that will not only reduce America's emissions, but also influence the world at large to give up fossil fuels. That policy is subsidies for specific renewable technologies, the exact approach used by the Inflation Reduction Act. So Ben Zer, I think, but I don't think his argument is that the US should keep polluting. It's just about the policies that get us to that outcome, right? To the outcome of, of reduced pollution. In terms of cutting emissions directly, the Inflation Reduction Act is no more of a global game changer than a US carbon tax would be. The bill is a great step and a landmark victory, but the people who say the planet has now been saved are pulling your leg a bit, little bit. In fact, who says that? <laughs> has anybody actually said that? I don't even think Biden said anything like that. The planet has now been saved. Whatever. In fact, the Rhodium Group analysis above predicts that the bill would decrease US emissions by an amount that corresponds to only about 1 to 1.3% of global total emissions. So why do I keep saying that the IRA subsidies are better than carbon taxes? There are two reasons. The first, which economists know about but often just ignore, is the international price effect I talked about above. Carbon taxes make fossil fuels cheaper. Renewable subsidies do not make fossil fuels cheaper. Thus, the effect of subsidies is not partially cancelled out by international price effects. The way the effect of carbon taxes is. What? Wait, what? But it... Wait, no, I don't get this. So if... So suppose... So suppose the effect... The, the, the intended effect of a renewable subsidy is to increase 
the use of renewables in a relative sense, maybe in an absolute sense, but, all, but mostly in a relative sense to carbon, right? Therefore, just like a carbon tax, it would result in less use of carbon, which would, have, which would reduce the price of carbon internationally, just like a carbon tax. Now, I mean, we can... Okay, so no, as someone in the comments pointed out, renewable subsidies actually do decrease fossil fuel prices a bit as well, though less than carbon taxes. Yeah, okay, so you, I, I mean, I could believe plausibly that the relative magnitudes of these effects are different. But then, is that not just because you're reducing carbon use less? If the effect isn't as big then you're reducing carbon use less. Which is bad, because you want to reduce it by as much as possible. So renewables are having less of an effect. I mean, in the this is a short-term thing, though, right? So let, let's, let's continue. Okay, so that's not his main argument. But in fact, there's a far more important advantage of subsidies... They're much better than carbon taxes at taking advantage of learning curves. Learning curves for renewable technology are something that every climate wonk and energy wonk... I hate the word wonk, by the way. I hate it. What was that? <laughs> I think it was that vanilla opinions person on Twitter, if you have Twitter, who tweeted something like, uh, you're not a policy wonk, you're 14. It is literally just a word used by like all the wannabe, uh, the wannabe economists and neoliberal types that you find online, just to try and make them make them uh, make themselves feel smart and sophisticated. It's a really American word, by the way, as well. And all American things are bad. No climate economist, uh, yeah, but no climate economist seems to know about. Ramez Nam. My favorite energy wonk has been yet oh shut up has been yelling about learning curves for over a decade now. The basic idea is that the more you build of a technology, solar panels or lithium ion batteries, the cheaper it gets. There are several reasons for this, economies of scale learning by doing incentives for follow-on intervention innovation ETC. It's widely believed that learning curves are behind the amazing cost drops we've seen in both solar and batteries over the past few decades. Here's a good Ramez thread about solar learning curves, where you can actually see the curves graphed out. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to get banned, uh, Peter. Is it just pronounced Peter? Is that right? That, that, that spelling? Something tells me it is, but I might be wrong. Do I think that a combination of taxes and subsidies is the answer? Well, yeah, that's, that seems, that's like becoming my kind of anodyne conclusion. But we've got a lot, we've got a lot more to read, you know. Yes, yeah, Peter, yeah. Subsidies for, subsidies for renewables advance the technology and lower prices globally. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a feature that they have that carbon taxes don't have. So this chart is on a linear scale, though. Oh, wait. Oh, geez. Okay, this is quite long. Solar is plunging in cost faster than anyone, including me, predicted. Today, today I'm publishing... See, this is one of the things where... He's done an article, and then he's done a... He's done a tweet thread of the article, which is something that I really don't like. Why am I so miserable today? I just, like, just fucking write the article. And sell it, like, why does everything have to be on Twitter now? Articles are better. All else equal. Okay, so... This chart is on a linear scale, though. Wright's law is an exponential process. Every doubling of scale drives a percent change in cost. If Wright's law holds, then on a log-log graph of cost versus scale, we should see straight lines. We do, and we get excellent fits. So you get twice as much, twice as much uh, solar will give you like a, a certain percentage reduction in cost. Okay. 
Solar electricity costs are dropping by an incredible 30 to 40% per doubling. I mean, that is wild, isn't it? That is, that is a ridiculous learning rate. We might go back to his actual article on this. Um, we may do. I'm not going to read the thread because I'm, I'm rebelling against Twitter threads. Oh, yeah, yeah, paywalls. Benzo, that's a good point. Paywalls are a good reason to use, to use Twitter for a, a, an article. <clears throat> now, as any economist knows, it's important to know whether these learning curves are causal. Of course, as stuff gets cheaper, there's an incentive to install more of it. And learning curves aren't the only reason stuff can get cheaper over time. So we have to make sure that installation is actually driving price declines before we decide that learning curves are magic. There are some papers out there about learning effects in general, but these probably don't tell us much about the specific cases of solar and batteries. Get to the point. Fortunately, there's a lot we can observe directly about the sources of costs in the solar industry just by looking at detailed data from within the industry. For example, if utilities find that it's cheaper to build bigger solar plants, then we pretty much know that funding the building of larger plants will drive costs down. And if we observe that plants becoming, became, become more efficient at installing panels over time without any change in what they're installing, we know that learning by doing is at work. We can then roughly decompose cost declines into all the factors we can observe. Okay. My favorite paper that does this is Kavlak McNerney, McNerney and Trankik, Transik. Looking at a bunch of industry data on solar costs, they find that in the early days of solar, R&D was responsible for most of the cost decline. But since the turn of the century, economies of scale and learning by doing have been responsible for a little more than half the solar cost decline. Wait, what? How is that a little... Since the turn of the century. Oh, right, okay, he's just referring to that one. Right, okay, so now so now it's all about economies of scale and a bit of learning by... Learning by doing stayed constant, right? So that's 1980 to 2001, 2001, 2012, then overall. Learning by doing is the same. Economies of scale is bigger recently and public and private R&D is smaller recently. So learning curves may not be 100% causal, but there's lots of causality there. Batteries might be different, of course, but it seems unlikely, given that... L is that supposed to say Li? Is that lithium? Lithium ion and similar technologies are now fairly mature. And of course, remember that R&D can also be part of learning curves. Yes, when the demand for a product increases, there's more incentive to pour research money into figuring out how to make more of that, more of that product. In other words, we can be fairly confident that for a lot of renewable technologies, simply building more of the stuff will push down the price. This is where subsidies shine. Carbon taxes can incentivize a switch to greener technologies, but they can also incentivize cutting back on production or improving energy efficiency. Subsidies for renewables, on the other hand, simply incentivize building more, more, more. And because of learning curves, that drives the, down the price of renewables. And when renewables get cheaper, it gives China and India and all the other countries out there an incentive to decarbonize that has nothing to do with climate change. These countries will naturally tend to balk at the idea of tightening their belts and cutting back for the good of the planet. China because they want to be tough and strong for geopolitical dominance. India and other developing nations because they want to escape desperate poverty. He's got a bit of yellow fever, hasn't he?
But if renewables are just cheaper than fossil fuels, those other countries will switch simply because it makes hard-nosed economic sense. Fair. Is China because they want to be tough and strong for geopolitical dominance. I mean, it's like it's part partly true in the in the way that like it's kind of true for any country that has the opportunity, right? But why is that not true for India? <laughs> And why is the poverty thing not true for China? Escaping poverty has been such a big aim of Chinese policy for so long. Like, I don't know why you would put front and center geopolitical dominance. Like, it's wrong on both counts, isn't it? It's like the assumption that India isn't doing anything like that, and then the assumption that China isn't um trying to reduce poverty like that would you know why would you write it like this and in fact there are signs that this is happening china is building so much renewable energy that they're worried about losing farmland to solar plants exclamation mark china china has consistently deployed more solar and wind than it has promised beating its clean energy targets it may be on path to peak its carbon emissions sooner than its pledge uh, of 2030. Interesting. Wow, that's really that really contradicts what I would normally think about China. I have to say, honestly, I I I, di I didn't think that about China. Yeah, Chris, Chris XX, Chris Ad XX. I, I agree in in theory. I mean, more diplomacy is difficult. So Stretch Mark says another issue is that when you flood the grid with renewables all at the same time, you have too much supply. Therefore, renewables can't make their money back. The rate at which they get cheaper doesn't keep up with the economics of how little they pay back due to oversupply. It's true, but then would the subsidies not, not account for that? Could you not design the subsidies to account for that so that they, while they're not making money, they're, you know, they've got funding from the government? And solar is so much cheaper than coal in India now that the country is rapidly shifting from the latter to the former. Other developing countries in Asia and Africa and Latin America will doubtless do the same because renewables are now simply cheap as heck. I mean, this is quite promising, right? This is the idea. This is like the same thing as when there are some countries where they just like never had landline phones because they weren't electrified, you know, during the... Uh, the era of landline phones, you know, post World War Two, um, through to sort of the, the turn of the millennium. So, so they just skipped straight to to mobile phones, and then you know you can maybe countries that don't use as much energy could hopefully skip straight to fossil fuel uh, to renewables, skip fossil fuels straight to renewables. Eventually, you have to lift the subsidies, though. I mean, do do you not? But there, would that not would there not be a period where the market stabilizes as well, and then you could lift the subsidies? Fossil fuels, hydropower, and nuclear fission are the only sources for grid energy that have been proven at scale. Solar and wind lack natural storage. Hmm. Interesting. Carbon taxes could never, never could have done anything like this. This was a function of the magic of technology and of learning curves. Countries like Germany and China that subsidized solar in the 2000s and 2010s before it made economic sense helped push those costs down and accelerate this trend. And the subsidies in the Inflation Reduction Act will do the same. The incentives for a deployment of 
solar power, electric vehicles, hydrogen, heat pumps, electric home appliances, and other renewable technologies on a mass scale in the world's largest or second largest economy will continue driving the prices of these technologies down and give all the countries of the world an incentive to adopt all of these things at an accelerated pace, which will in turn drive prices down even more. It's a virtuous cycle, a key part of the green vortex that's our best hope for beating climate change. What's the green vortex? Hmm. I really, you know, this habit of linking to things, um, t you know, assumed knowledge that's just like covered up by a link. I, I don't like it. Economists simply miss this, not because the discipline of econ is blind to the idea of learning curves. In fact, the ideas of economies of scale and learning by doing come from econ. But for some reason, economists only considered climate policy in terms of a single externality, the negative externality of greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, there was another externality at work, the positive externality of technological progress that we could harness to fight the negative one. And thanks to climate wonks and democratic politicians, we are going to harness it. We're going to make cheap energy and green energy synonymous. And we're going to accelerate the virtuous cycle of decarbonization, not just in America, but all around the globe. I mean, who the fuck does he think he is? Anyway, so, like, that article was okay. <laughs> um, I mean, basically, it's just the J-curve, right? This is the this is the cool J curve. Am I thinking of the J curve? Trade balance. No, I'm not I'm not talking about Okay, J curve is used for a lot of uh, a lot of different things but the j-curve technology is just like hmm. the j-curve 4 technology it's just like when you basically got this like initial loss right I mean, it's used for obviously a lot of things, but it's just like performance time, right? It's just like how good something, how well something goes over time. It's like initially, you know, you move away from the status quo, you try something new like solar panels when they first, when they were first invented. And it's like, they don't really work. It's a load of crap. And then you get this sudden, like massive jump in, in um, there, you did this turnaround, then this massive steep jump in how, how well they do right so that's that type of thing is just basically what what he's talking about j curves but i have a question why so that that's all i mean look renewable subsidies are a, are a more direct way to encourage investment in renewable subsidies right but <laughs> um yeah ng spy you're not wrong so so <laughs> what i'm what i'm trying to figure out is i no smith's article doesn't address the key issue that i was kind of getting at with this stream which is that basically you would expect carbon taxes and renewable subsidies to have similar effects in many ways. And talking about, you know, the um, exponential innovation, the J-curve, what, you know, learning by doing economies of scale, whatever you want to call it, that doesn't actually address the issue of how you're eliciting that investment into renewables because you can do it with renewable subsidies 
but you could also do it with a carbon tax, right? So if carbon becomes relatively more expensive, the, the renewable renewables become relatively less expensive. And so could that not affect investment into renewables as well? And that argument, I thought that would be what the article was about, right? Like that, di addressing that direct argument. Instead, there was like, it was like political, which is fine. Like I agree, politically, I think renewable subsidies are definitely better, um, are definitely better than, than carbon taxes. And it does seem also, unlike carbon taxes, renewable subsidies have a bit more of an evidence base, a bit more of a history. So that's fine. But then... You know, why? Maybe we'll find out if we read this article. I mean, this is INET, so this is going to be, like, actually good. Is it really better to make fossil fuel more expensive than the renewables cheaper? I mean, yeah, you could go on the old age adage of you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. You know, you're not you're funding alternatives, aren't you? Which obviously which seems like a more direct way to increase the availability of them. <laughs> that was pretty funny, Owen. I, I'll, I'll give you that one. I thought he argued taxation increases global use of oil while subsidies don't, but if they relatively reduce the oil of re use of oil, then demand for oil falls anyway, so they're not really different. Yeah, exactly. This was the... This was the that was the thing that, like, confused me. And then there was just loads of stuff about China. <laughs> Targeting fossil fuels makes people angry because it feels like an attack. Yeah, it makes people angry and it doesn't... It doesn't just make big fossil fuel corporations angry, does it? It makes, like, it makes everyone angry. And, you know, a lot of, like, working people need their cars. Certainly renewable subsidies, they're more in line with the idea of like, you know, putting forward an alternative, right? Building a better world, allowing people to see what it could be like. Yeah, SORP, I mean... I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe to 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 some extent we do need to. I mean, yeah, I agree we need to use less energy and probably we consume too much in at least in rich countries. I'm not a hundred percent convinced though. I mean, maybe, maybe we can we can go into this later or or another time. But I'm not a hundred percent convinced that um, localized production is necessarily better for the environment. I know, like, I remember speaking a bit to Antonia Jennings about it, because it it just, you, you, you'd you love it if it worked, because I'm, I support, like, community wealth building, right, and community initiatives, but the, their effects on the environment are, like, ambiguous, because sometimes you do get kind of, you might get environmental economies of scale from, like, specialization, producing things in certain areas of the world or areas of the country and then transporting them and it can be the case that even with the transportation you, you do you know you do better in terms of emissions or environmental damage not always but i'm just saying it's ambiguous
Wait, trailblazer. Carbon, carbon taxes are regressive. Subsidies shift wealth from poorer people to richer ones. Degrowth is political and moral suicide. If you hate emissions, re-regulate nuclear. Why would subsidies shift wealth from poorer people to richer ones? Because you can... If you've got... Not, I mean, that's dependent on tax taxation. Okay, see you later, NG spy. Okay, so so this article is much more against carbon pricing. So carbon pricing isn't effective at reducing CO2 emissions. And electric vehicles don't do a lot better. Matt Iglesias had a good post. Okay. One second. Um, beating climate change absolutely requires new technology. Is this the one you mean? We can have a look at that. Yeah, it looks like you can read it. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. Right, I thought I had a sneeze coming, but I don't. Okay, I had a good sneeze. Urban agriculture. Yeah, I mean, that, that could be a good idea, Sorp. Like, I don't know too much about it, but... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm for, like, greener cities in general. And you, some localised production, if it worked effectively, then I guess it, it could be... Um... It could be effective. But what if, like, a lot of smaller... Um... Whoops. What if a lot of smaller... Um... like smaller little plots are less efficient right that could be it could result in like more soil usage and more like energy usage if everybody's got like you know is like let's say is everybody having an individual lawnmower <laughs> and plow is that actually less efficient in terms of the environment than if um you have like one big one over one big area that's that's my question How does carbon pricing affect macroeconomic balance and ultimately CO2 emission? What about electric vehicles that are now being promoted by the Biden administration? Economist standard advice for controlling global warming is to impose a high price on emitting CO2, which is said to discourage carbon intensive activities and induce carbon saving technical change. In a recent review of the New Deal, William Janeway draws a distinction between efficient and effective policies. He comes close to economists speak by describing efficiency as a low-cost means for moving towards a desired goal. Whether an efficient intervention will be effective in reaching the goal is another question altogether. In the short to medium run, raising carbon prices within a politically acceptable range may be efficient at inducing macroeconomically small changes in the structure of the economy and level of, the em of emission. But the move will not be effective because the changes will remain small for at least three reasons. Energy constitutes a relatively small proportion of economic activity. It is crucial for the functioning of the macro system, but usually is not the tail that wags the dog. Carbon pricing brings in the little triangles of economic welfare analysis applied by Arnold Harberger, which are not significant in terms of GDP. 
The re reason, as illustrated below, is that percentage change in, say, gasoline demand in response to a higher tax is the product of a negative price elasticity of demand, which is a fraction of the percentage change in price, typically less than 100%. The product of two fractions is smaller than both, meaning that the demand response is weak. Even if the magnitude of the long-run elasticity is bigger than the short-run value, the conclusion remains. Wait. In response to a higher tax is the product of a negative price elasticity of demand, which is a fraction of the percentage change in price. Wait, okay, we'll wait for his illustration of this. I, don't, I feel like that wasn't expressed very clearly, even though I think I know what he means. Finally, following Harberger and lurching into jargon, economists usually assume that the proceeds of a tax are passed in lump sum fashion back to consumers. This transfer produces an income effect, simulating, stimulating demand for all goods, including gasoline. This increase can partially offset the price-induced demand reduction due to substitution of other goods for lower purchases of gasoline. Substitution effects almost always dominate income effects, so that most of the transferred income gets spent on non-energy goods and services. Total gasoline consumption still declines. Somewhat similar reasoning applies to electric vehicles. They have a great advantage in delivering around 70% of the energy they use for moving the vehicle, as opposed to 25% for internal combustion engines counterparts but the electricity has to come from some source. As of now, 60% of the energy going towards electricity generation in the USA comes from fossil fuels. Unless that share is substantially reduced, EVs will not shift energy accounting by very much. They are efficient in reducing end-of-use petroleum in the transport sector, but not effective in controlling CO2. Details appear below. It is interesting that because I, I always think this it's like thank you for following whoever that was and thank you a blit was it you that followed um um yeah it always it's always funny to me that like <laughs> people people say oh oh well you know electric cars are better because they don't use fossil fuels and it's like well where does most electricity come from it still comes from fossil fuels and there's just this idea that like because it because it doesn't have to it's somehow the same as it not not doing right it's just like it's just a bit um yeah i don't know it's kind it's kind of wishful thinking isn't it a rebound effect yeah newt the whales agree how close is your video on theory is of value being done? Uh, it's uh, the script's basically finished, but I haven't recorded it yet. So it will probably be in October. It will be released in October. I mean, obviously, because otherwise it would have to be released today. But what I mean is it's not going to be released in November. <laughs> To make the arguments as clearly as possible, the paper sets out an economy-wide social accounting matrix combining energy and national income in one place. An introductory one-sector SAM in Table 1 is extended in Table 2 to a matrix with non-energy, 90% of the economy, and energy sectors. Calculation shows how higher national carbon prices will have minimal short to medium term effects. With its relatively low carbon prices, the USA is far behind the rest of the world in attacking global warming. A gallon of gasoline costs around $2.50 here versus at least $7 in Western Europe. Reducing global warming from the American side would have to combine reductions or mitigation of CO2 emission with technical change to cut back the two-thirds share of primary energy not put to economically productive ends. 
Higher carbon prices at most could be a necessary but not sufficient condition for such changes to occur. Details are sketched below. It is interesting as well that, you know, despite one argument against carbon taxes, I would say, is like, yeah, okay, the USA does use more fossil fuels per capita or has historically used more fossil fuels per capita than most other countries. And things do revolve around cars a lot more there. People do drive a lot more. But despite the fact that, you know, oil, petrol, gasoline is, is almost three times more on average in Western Europe, people still drive a lot here as well, right? You're not, you know, these, this, ta this taxation because is not eliminating is not eliminating things and it, you could say oh well let, you could if you you know take it to an extreme you could let's put it up to like a hundred dollars but then you know that that's political suicide right you you know that it's going to affect so many people's lives negatively people aren't going to be able to get to work it's going to have really really negative effects on a lot of people um and it, you know it speaks to this issue of you, you've got to show them alternatives you know you've got to pedestrianize city centers have cycling, have better public transport, better trains, you know, design cities and, and countries around other forms of transportation than cars. Show them the way, you know. So electric vehicles are also more efficient than internal combustion engines. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, so wait. Yeah, he does note this. He does note this. But yeah, no, they are they are better. There's no doubt that they're better. I, I mean, I just don't like cars, so, you know, what am I going to say? <laughs> the SAM in Table 1 introduces the numbers. The accounting conventions are that entries in the rows of the matrix are valued at the same price and that sums of entries in corresponding rows and columns, say sources and uses of household income, should be equal. Macroeconomic data come from the National Income and Product Accounts of the US Bureau of Economic Analysis reporting economic activity. Flows of energy use per unit time, so we are really talking about power, are lifted from charts generated by Livermore National Labs. Well, let's take a look at this thing. Whoops. Right. Oh, that's the Sam. Sorry, I was like, I was like, why is that a Sam? It's not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. In both technical usage and popular discussion, Energy flows and CO2, or carbon emissions per unit of time, are quantified with a bewildering array of numbers. Livermore's estimates are expressed in units of quadrillion British thermal units, or quads of energy per year. US 2019 annual primary power use was 100.2 quads. Quadrillion. That's the first time I've seen quadrillion used, used like for something serious. In international standard SI units, the implied rate of power consumption was 3.38 terawatts on the low side in comparison to other US estimates. The SAM in Table 1 shows that the total value added in 2019 was $21.4 trillion. Probably around 10% or $2 trillion was supported by primary energy, mostly fossil fuels as shown in the Livermore diagram. Yeah, so coal, natural gas, petroleum. Yeah. One quad per year of primary energy roughly generates $20 billion of value added. One terawatt supports $592 billion. Total US carbon, not CO2 emissions, in 2019 were 1.39 billion tonnes. GDP per unit of emissions was 15.4 million, 
An energy value added per ton was, was 1.54 million. The ratio of 1 billion tons of carbon emissions in response to $1 trillion of value added was 0.065. In Livermore's usage, two-thirds of primary energy is rejected in line with the first and second laws of thermodynamics. Or wasted might be a better word. The energy put to use amounts to 32.7 quads or $754 billion of value added. Residential and transport services, this is very, very dense. Residential and transport services, mostly used for consumption by household, absorb 13.7 quads, or $274 billion. The remaining unwasted energy value added of $480 billion is used for electricity generation, commercial services, and industry. The value of rejected energy is split between $800 billion from production and $500 billion from consumption. Hmm. When he says GDP per so GDP per ton of emissions was fifteen, why well, doesn't he say GDP per ton of emissions was fifteen point four million dollars? Hmm. This is uh this is this is heavy stuff, everyone. Just like it's just not written in a way that explains it, you know what I mean? Economists. The other entries in SAM come from NIPA numbers. Household and government consumption get separate columns with exports and investment bundled together. The cost column includes the usual major flows. Adopting SAM accounting conventions, household income of fifteen point four trillion dollars comes from both wage and non wage sources. It is used for consumption of fourteen point six trillion dollars and savings of eight hundred billion dollars. It seems clear that Table 1 accounting should be expanded to include energy and non-energy sectors explicitly, with inter-industry transactions built into the structure of costs. This extension will allow us to look in detail at how price changes impact the composition of consumption, value added, and energy rejection. As noted above, adverse macroeconomic repercussions transmitted through the accounting will limit the effectiveness of carbon prices and reducing the use of fossil fuel energy. Values of energy flows in dollars. This is like I feel I feel like I'm not okay so this is just a model right I don't think it's worth going all of the di over all of all of this model this is just him describing an economic model like you need to you know what I mean? You need like a fucking pen and paper to get to grips with this fully. But let's look at this, this bit on energy taxes and transfers. Now consider the impact of a tax on consumption of energy services. A hypothetical tax on gasoline can add numerical perspective. One gallon contains 5.5 pounds or 2.5 kilograms of carbon, implying that 400 gallons contain one ton. If gasoline costs $2 per gallon, then a 50% tax of $1 
would raise $400 per tonne of carbon at the high end of the range of prices now being discussed in the literature. The implied change in energy use is energy consumption change equals price elasticity times 0.5 times initial use. 50% tax, 0.5 price elasticity times initial use. Table 2 shows that final sales from the energy sector are 1.3 trillion, including 520 billion for gasoline. A higher magnitude estimate of the short run price elasticity would be 0.2, minus 0.2, so that the fall in energy consumption would be 0.2 times 0.5 times 0.52 trillion equals 0.052 trillion. A decrease of $52 billion in gasoline consumption is trivial in macroeconomic terms. So that, that's basically what he, mean, he meant at the beginning, right? When he's saying a fraction, so the tax is a fraction, probably. I mean, I guess you could have a 100% tax, but that times the initial use of of um gasoline times the price elasticity of demand <clears throat> you're timesing a fraction by another fraction and the result of that is always a tiny little result right From the ratio of carbon emissions to the value added quoted above, the annual total of 1.39 billion tonnes would fall by 0.065 times 0.052, 3.4 million tonnes. Reduced emissions would still be nugatory at 8 million, I've never seen that word used before, <laughs> that's a cute word, at 8 million tonnes, even if the 26.5 quads worth 0.05 trillion of rejected energy associated with residential and transportation services is taken into account. A long run price elasticity of minus 0.4 would not change these results substantially. Well, it would, it would double the magnitudes, right? 0.2, 0.4. Okay. The usual recommendation is that the proceeds of an energy consumption tax should be passed back to consumers. If the amount is estimated as the new price times the change in consumption, it will be 1.5 times 0.03 trillion equals 0.045 trillion. An overestimate of the rebate could be based on total household energy consumption. The amount would be 0.45 trillion or, or $450 billion. Either way, the transfer is still small in comparison to the existing flow of $3.1 trillion in the SAM. The rebate amounts to a shift of 3% of initial total consumption. If income elasticities of demand are both equal to 1, energy consumption in response to the initial trans version of the transfer would rebound by about $10 billion against the substitution response of $52 billion. Non-energy purchases would rise by $130 billion. Ah. It, so despite the density, I don't think the model's important because it's basically just a series of like inputs and outputs um given in terms of like how much energy energy they uh, the economy uses right so it's like a representation of the economy um as a, a table a matrix but bearing in mind energy usage so that's fine but th this despite it being a bit hard going in the top at the top uh, i think this is quite convincing Because basically, the effect of a carbon tax is so small that you, you just don't get that much of an impact in the end. And then if you have a rebate, it's even, you know, the effect is even more diluted. Because the tax is a fraction, the elasticity of demand is probably a fraction. 
we know the elasticity of demand small for for things like gasoline or, or petrol, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. A Harburger Triangle supposedly measures the change in economic welfare associated with a change in a tax or subsidy. In comparison to macroeconomic aggregates, estimates are almost always small along the lines just discussed. The price manipulation, however, affects the whole existing volume of sales. A 5% tax applied to £520 billion pound, uh, dollars of gasoline purchases would bring in $26 billion. Republican grandees James Baker and George Schultz, in connection with the Climate Leadership Council, proposed a carbon tax of $40 per tonne of CO2, or $147 per tonne of carbon, which proceeds to be distributed as a dividend to U.S. household. U.S. 2019 volume gasoline sales were 146 billion gallons. The resulting tax and transfer would be 53 billion, which can be compared to total fiscal payments of 3.2 trillion mentioned above. Applying a similar tax to all final energy sales would provide $230 billion. With 129 million households, the carbon dividend from a gasoline tax would provide each one with around $400. A similar tax on all energy sales would increase the transfer to $1,800. We are still not talking about a big amount of money in comparison to GDP or even pre-existing fiscal transfer flows. Needless to say, extraordinary transfers associated with the COVID pandemic were much lar larger. The bottom line is that a tax on household consumption of energy services would have very modest impact economy-wide. These results are fully in line with Harberger's original paper, which he argued that the effects of distortions which argued that the effects of distortions due to monopoly are small, his little triangles carry over to considerations of energy use. Tobin's 1977 old observation that it takes a heap of Harberger, Harberger trials, triangles to fill an oaken gap neatly summarizes the situation. Similar conclusions apply to movements in input-output coefficients due to higher energy costs in production. That is, a tax on energy costs would presumably induce lower input output coefficients for energy into industry sales or higher input 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 output coefficients for non-energy sales with typical elasticities of substitution the shifts would be small in macroeconomic terms yeah so just like really really um small yeah small effects because you've just got mild relative movements multiplied by each other and the macroeconomic impact is really small. Okay, so is he, yeah, he's going to, let's finish this article. He's going to talk about other, other alternatives and he's also going to talk about electric vehicles and he's also going to talk about Biden. Within American political limitations on raising carbon prices, can you imagine even $5 per gallon for gasoline? Yep, fair enough. The standard economist's recommendation for reducing global warming does not have traction. The key tasks are to cut into energy consumption by other means and to offset CO2 emissions generated by a given level of power applied to economic ends. Economists lack the technical skills to deal seriously with either issue, but, few, but a few observations make sense. The Livermore diagram shows that of the 20, 37 quads of energy flowing to electricity generation, 21.9 come from coal, um, 10.2, and natural gas, 11.7. Wait, what? What's the 10.2 doing there? Natural gas is 31.32.1, isn't it? Whatever. W given the well-known difference in the rate of CO2 emissions from the two fossil fuels, replacement of coal by gas and much more importantly by non-fossil fuel sources of energy makes sense. 
Similarly, electricity in principle can replace a portion of the 26 quads, $520 billion or 2.5% of GDP, of petroleum used for transportation, of which 22 quads are rejected. President Biden's energy proposals put emphasis on electric vehicles. Again, we meet Janeway's contrast between relatively efficient policy initiative and one that is effective in reducing global warming. A big network of charging stations and subsidies on purchases are important components of the package, but suppose that over the next few years, electric vehicles replace two quads of the six that go from petroleum to transportation services, along with 7.3 quads of wasted energy. Of total carbon emission of 1.39 billion tonnes in 2019, the reduction that EVs might permit is 0.25 times 4.6 times 1.39 equals 160 million tonnes. This is a significant number, but less than 12% of total emissions. The result is that the familiar consequence the result is the familiar consequence of multiplying two fractions. Big reductions in emissions would have to come from replacing fossil fuel with pr renewable primary energy sources and or carbon sequestration. There are many such examples. In a book written for MIT undergraduates, Jaffe and Taylor lay out options at a somewhat technical level. Somewhat technical. I should imagine if you think it's somewhat technical, mate, then it's extremely technical. Grab et al. do the same with less physics and chemistry. Economists also have other theories. That's true, economists always have more theories. Stiglitz, 2019, considers induced innovation over time in terms of trade-offs between increases in energy and labour productivity responding to shifts in the cost of carbon. Like most of the literature, the discussion is largely theoretical. Stiglitz conveniently ignores the fact that labour and energy productivity levels have increased at close to equal rates for centuries. He also examines the welfare impacts of carbon taxes and subsidies, treating them as macroeconomically crucial. The discussion above shows how they are in fact insignificant in the relative range of magnitude, relevant range of magnitude, sorry. Wait, what? Why is he, so he was just talking about carbon taxes, but now he's talking about subsidies. Does that, Wait a second. Wait a goddamn second. But w really, it's a but really, he's been talking about a carbon tax. So I don't think you can generalize that conclusion to. to subsidies because like okay so like we were just talking about because of like j curves learning by doing economies of scale the impact of a subsidy might actually be really big so the you know where is the impact of a tax on carbon usage is relatively small as we've established the impact of a subsidy on renewable usage especially over the long term could actually be very very big so they won't be macroeconomically insignificant. So I don't know why he's thrown that in because this this article and this entire model and calculation isn't about carb uh, isn't about subsidies. It's just about taxes, really. Subsidies are mentioned in passing, but it's not. You can't just assume they've got the similar, um, well, not elasticities of 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 demand, but you know, similar magnitudes involved. As of this writing, the Biden infrastructure and energy plan appears to be in a state of flux. Ty Carb Wait, when was this written? May. Oh, this is from May. Wait. May 2021. Jeez. Okay, that was a while ago. Carbon prices are not central, though, although stable, relatively high levels could support rates of energy productivity growth in line with labor productivity, the historical pattern. What? I don't understand that sentence. I don't think it follows. Or maybe, maybe I haven't, because I didn't go into the model in enough depth. Along with supporting electric vehicles, tied to regulation along with subsidies and new investment in the vicinity of the $200 billion per year are likely to figure. The practical task will be to make sure that these interventions produce tangible results. These are largely issues about specific technologies, not carbon pricing. That's true. 
Even more fundamental, in the USA, the government since World War II has pursued a policy of keeping energy prices low, which is one of the main long-term determinants of uh, the urban sprawl and other characteristics of spatial social organization now. Carbon pricing is part of this policy outcome, but may be more a symptom of deeper socioeconomic forces than a cause. Harberger Triangles and Baker Schultz carbon dividends just scratch the surface. Hey, there's Baker, Baker Schultz again. Um, let's write this up then, because I do think... Why is it framed as taxes versus subsidies? Why, like, why not both? Well, the answer, the answer, my my friend, uh, is political will, right? That's yeah, of course. Like in an ideal world, if we're dictators, we implement both, absolutely. But it's just, uh, it's more about, um, yeah, it's more about political will. Which one are we going to focus on? And that's something that this thread early on. Um, that I looked at early on. I'm not sure if you're on the stream, but the thread with um, uh, that bloke. The thread with Bob, Bob Cop. He was talking about how he thinks that focusing on carbon pricing might actually have led to which ended up failing in 2009 may have led to um worse climate legislation than focusing on renewable subsidies so interesting um interesting thread but yeah well you know ideally of course you just have both Cool. Um, so what am I doing? Taylor, um, Sam, showing that, or not showing, I would say a better word would be highlighting how um, renewable, how um, carbon taxes have small effects uh, small macroeconomic effects. This results because the price elasticity of demand is typically low in magnitude minus 0.2 in this paper. And a tax would also generally be a fraction with with 50%. at the high end, end of typical proposals. Multiplying a fraction by a fraction gets always results in a really low number because maths. Typical proposals. Don't correct my rhetorical f flourish, Google. You're giving me shit about it. Ignore all. Shut up. Because maths. Calculates. So what? So let's take a look at the specific numbers here because I think it's worth... Um, uh, he doesn't do that until down here, does he? Fifty two billion that uh carbon tax on gasoline inverted commas because that's not a real word because it's American gasoline would would reduce consumption by reduce its consumption by $52 billion, um, and uh, which is 3.4 million tons of carbon. Uh, 
of carbon. Four million tons fewer carbon emissions. That's grammatically correct, that, but I don't, it doesn't sound right. Less carbon emissions. Hmm. Less in carbon emissions. Yeah, there you go. That rolls off the tongue better, doesn't it? Um, so... Yeah, um... These are pretty small. So where's the... Where does he sort of... Where does he contextualize this? I just want to contextualize it a bit for this document to show. Hmm. Yeah, I want to contextualize this a little bit, but exponential taxes for higher energy consumption. Yeah, a progressive carbon tax, Victor. I mean, that is, that's the dream, isn't it? That's what you want. But I mean, politically, fucking hell, good luck with that. I mean, you want it up to a level where you're basically just banning that type of thing, right? As a percentage reduction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for Feynman, that's, that's exactly what I'm trying to figure out. It doesn't really contextualize it very well. Um... C two E S. So if we go with this, three point four out of a uh, U.S. total of which is hmm. Zero point zero five percent. I mean, that is small. Very, very small. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, not very much. Um, I'm just going to say the critical thing that I noted at the end. He seems to casually generalize this conclusion to subsidies, even though the relevant elasticities, so, well, elasticity of supply, really, may be much higher. Higher given... Actually, in fact, let's we can refer back to this. Not that tweet. <laughs> this one. Given the incredible...
Okay, so that this is research, my friends. We just uh, we just spent an hour and a half reading stuff, and we uh, in fact we spent more than an hour and a half reading stuff, and we've got one paragraph out of it, which is actually good going. That's probably faster than the pace of uh, most research. We already got this. We already read that. I do want to do a, a a stream on nuclear power, so I I, I will um, have to talk to you if you're still there um, at some point. Maybe maybe the next one can be about nuclear power because I don't I'm not really very clued up on it to be honest. Um, is it Trailblazer? Or no, Stretch Marks. Stretch Marks. Sorry, Stretch Marks. Yeah, I think I think nuclear does it. It does seem like very underrated. Um, right, I want to read more about this. I think we've got some more interesting stuff to, to read. Um, I'm gonna... I'm gonna uh, be right back because I want to go to the toilet and also get a cup of tea. So everybody do those things. Toilet and or tea. There's the Google Docs that I'm literally on now. Um, I'll just be right back. What the hell?
All right, I'm back. Stop enjoying yourselves. Um. Yeah. So, so we're there's that's it's a pretty convincing argument about taxes, actually. I think. Which basically hinges on the fact that the response to them is just not that high. And that... Yeah, I mean, it was... One critique, again, of this, I was just thinking about this while I was making my tea. One critique of it would be that he is very focused on... Also focused on... Um, taxes on gasoline rather than industry level. Yeah, I don't, I mean, that's not an industry tax, is it? In fact, let's just, let's just specify that that's about, pe it's really about petrol. That's one thing, but <clears throat> I mean, there's nothing, there was nothing about uh, I I industry level carbon taxes. I'm glad that you didn't need the toilet, Russell. Go away. Can I just say one thing? I feel like substacks are really badly written in general. Even ones I like are really badly written. And it, I don't know. It's just this like they're like it's just this slow stream of like low quality content that we have. I mean I say that making a stream about with me reading out substacks. But they wouldn't be my first choice. Um Really, I mean, I, I didn't really like Noah Smith's one. I thought it was pretty badly put together. And the first paragraph of this has already annoyed me. But anyway, let's not jump to conclusions. I'm sure it's great. I was thinking of writing about why I disagree with Farhad Manju's column arguing that, a nu that nuclear power still doesn't make sense. But I saw some tweets about a failed carbon capture and sequestration project that I realized that I never replied to and realized that I never replied to an email asking why Slow Boring has paid tens of thousands of dollars for direct air capture carbon removal programs. What makes these topics hard to write about is that they involve complicated technical questions and the honest truth is that well-qualified technical experts disagree about all of them. But what links these topics together is that if we want to navigate the climate crisis in a remotely acceptable way, the world is going to need to develop some technologies that are currently unproven. The opposite view is rarely expressed in explicit terms because it's wrong, but it often implicitly backstops skepticism about things like nuclear, CCS and DAC. People will point out rightly that these technologies are pretty uncertain and unproven and currently seem to involve very high costs. Then they point to the fact that solar and wind work just fine, are well understood, and are cheap at the current margin. They'll say, why not just do that? And every once in a while, you see a take like Alejandro de la Garza's article in Time, arguing that we have the technology to solve climate change. What we need is political will.
This is true in the trivial sense that we could dramatically reduce CO2 emissions with currently available technology if we were willing to accept a large decline in living standards and world population. But that's not really a solution to the problem. We should absolutely deploy current technology more aggressively and thereby contribute to solving the problem. But we will also need some new technology in the future, and that means we need to keep an open mind toward investment. Renewables are great at the current margin. There's a weird internet cult of renewable haters and also the strange case of the state of Texas, where renewables are the number two source of electricity but politicians pretend they hate them. Hmm. This article is about the limits of the all-renewable strategy, but it doesn't come from a place of hate. The reason Texas a very conservative state with a locally powerful oil and gas extraction industry has so much renewable electricity is that large swathes of Texas are very windy, and building wind farms in windy places is a very cost-effective way to make electricity. And in a place where overall electricity demand is rising, both due to population growth in Texas and due to ongoing electrification of vehicles and home heat, renewables build-out does an enormous amount to reduce CO2 emissions and air pollution, Powering electric cars with electricity from gas-fired power plants would have emissions benefits, as I understand, because natural gas is less polluting than oil and because big power plants are regulated more stringently than car engines or home furnaces. But still, the emissions benefits are much larger if the electricity is partially or wholly generated by renewables. But the partially here is actually really important. An electric car that's powered 50% by renewables has lower emissions than one powered by 10% renewables, and higher emissions than one that's 90%. The, no the more renewables in the mix, the lower your emissions. You don't have to get to 100% renewable power. The key thing is to use more renewable power. And when people say accurately that renewables are now cheap, they mean that it's cheap at the current margin to add more renewable power to the mix. That's because electricity demand is growing, so a marginal addition of renewable electricity just gets tossed into the mix usefully. But it's also because Texas and other states have all this fixed infrastructure for burning natural gas already. If you get extra wind power, you can just burn less gas, and the gas is still there to use if you need it. California, probably the leading edge state on renewables, actually built a small number of emergency gas generators that they turned on for the first time at September 4th of this year to re meet rare peak demand and avoid blackouts. I mean, it does seem to me that natural gas is going to be a part of the, the future energy mix, right, in the, in the medium term as well as the short term, I would say. Just because it's so flexible and available and it's not as polluting as, as oil. I think these night bots come on too, uh, too frequently. A bit too frequently. Anyway. An all-renewable grid is very challenging. That California ex experience illustrates two things, I think. Democratic Party politicians are, in practice, much more pragmatic than unflattering conservative stereotypes of them would suggest. Democrats who've actually had to wrestle with practical problems know that we are further from an all-renewables utopia than environmentalist rhetor rhetoric suggests. Gavin Newsom knows perfectly well that he can't just have a statewide blackout once or twice a year and tell voters that's a small price to pay for meeting emissions goals. Voters want to see action on climate change, but they have very limited appetite for enduring personal sacrifice or inconvenience. Using renewables to dramatically reduce emissions, while still counting on gas backup, backup when needed, great. Securing even deeper emissions by accepting that power sometimes doesn't work, not great. Consider this data from my rooftop solar panels. The one good thing about Substack is that it 
it has this quite nice way of displaying pictures, I think. Not that it's the only one, but yeah. Solar energy. Home usage. Home consumption. Solar production. Net grid usage. Okay. The first pane says that so far in 2022, the panels have generated 102% of our household electricity use. Hooray. The second pane shows that we generated a huge electricity surplus, blue lines below zero, during the spring when it was sunny and cool. But we are in a small deficit over the summer, even when it's sunnier, when it's even sunnier, but our air conditioning use surges. The third pane shows that in September, whether we are in surplus or deficit on any given day hinges crucially on the weather. It's going to end up being a deficit month largely because of a big rainy stretch. Okay. So how much does this cost? Well, not very much. But because the key thing about this scenario is that all my kilowatts of electricity get used. When I'm in surplus, that extra electricity goes to the grid, where it substitutes for other sources of power, and I earn credits that offset my electricity usage during deficit periods. If I had to throw away my surplus kilowatts instead of selling them to the grid, my per kilowatt cost would soar. And if everyone had solar power, that's the problem we would face. Who would we export the extra, ele extra electricity to during surplus periods? At a small margin, we have the technology for this. Instead of exporting power during the day and importing it at night, I could get a home battery and store daytime excess for use at night. That would raise my per kilowatt cost, but only modestly since batteries aren't that expensive. And you can add wind as well as solar to your grid, so you have some resiliency against seasonal variations in sunlight. The problem is that without fossil fuels for resilience, the cost per megawatt of renewables soars because redundancy is expensive. Okay, yeah, so do, that is basically what I just said about like natural gas, right? Like, I mean, what, where do you get your redundancy? I mean, nuclear, I suppose, is the answer. But not nuclear and natural gas. Wasting electricity is costly. Seasonal variation is a big problem here, for example. Let's say you have enough solar panels to cover 100% of your electricity needs on an average December day. That means you're going to have, have way more panels than you need on an average June day when the sun is shining for much longer periods of time. On a pure engineering basis, that's fine. There are just some panels that in practice are only generating power for a few days per year in the dead of winter. But the cost per megawatt of those panels is going to be astronomical because a solar panel is almost 100% fixed costs. Hmm. The same is true of random fluctuations in weather. If you're like Texas and rely on a mix of gas and wind, then wind is cheap. You add some turbines and that means you burn less gas. If there's some freak day when there's very little wind, then you burn an unusually large amount of gas. As long as you're using almost all the wind power you generate, the cost per megawatt of your turbines is low. But if you try to build enough turbines to keep the lights on during low wind days, you're wasting wind on high wind days. This means your cost per megawatt rises. This is very drawn out, this article, for a pretty simple point, in my opinion, but whatever. Because massively overbuilding renewables would not only cost a lot of money, but wastefully consume vast tracts of land, it seems like a better idea would be to use long-term batteries. If you had really big batteries that stored electricity for a long time, you could simply store surplus power in the high season and unleash it in the low season. In fact, if you are lucky enough to have large hydroelectric dams at your disposal, you can probably use them as a seasonal storage vehicle. You can let the water pile up when renewables are at maximum capacity and then run it through the dam when you need it. Not coincidentally, politicians from the Pacific Northwest, when that, where there's tons of hydro, tend to be huge climate hawks. But for the rest of us, it's hypothetical storage technology to the rescue. I'm not saying anything here that renewables proponents aren't aware of. 
Hawks and doves as well, as well as wonks. It also annoys me. I've heard that countries with a lot of renewables find that wind always blows somewhere. The important thing is a grid that can shift the power around as, as needed. Hmm. Yeah. I guessed it, but he's saying the fixed cost of that would be so high, which I, I understand, right? Or just the cost, the overall cost, but mostly fixed costs. I'm not saying anything here that renewables proponents aren't aware of. They write articles about seasonal electricity storage all the time. There are plenty of ideas here that could work, ranging from ideas on technological cutting edge to brute force engineering concepts like using pumps to create extra hydro capacity. Another idea is that maybe you could replace a lot of current fossil fuel use with burning hydrogen, and then you could manufacture hydrogen using renewable electricity while accepting seasonal variation in the level of hydrogen output. It might work. Hmm. Speaking of hypothetical, wouldn't that just have the same problem if it's, if it's variable? Hmm. Burning hydrogen while well, accepting season. Can you store hydrogen? I guess you can store hydrogen more easily than you can just store energy. That's the point. Speaking of hypothetical hydrogen applications, it's also worth saying that while electricity, cars, and home heat together can constitute a very large percentage of global emissions, they are not the whole picture. You can build an electric airplane with current technology, but we absolutely do not have a zero carbon replacement for conventional passenger airplanes at hand. Nor do we currently have the ability to manufacture steel, concrete or various chemicals in a cost effective way without setting fossil fuels on fire. Is that true? I didn't know you could build electric airplanes. I thought they'd be too heavy. These aren't necessarily unsolvable problems, but they have not, in fact, been solved. It isn't a lack of political will that has denied us the ability to do zero-carbon maritime shipping. Right now, the only proven way to power a large ship without CO2 emissions is to use one of the nuclear reactors from an aircraft carrier. But this is both illegal and ex insanely expensive. You could maybe do something with hydrogen here, or else it is possible that if the Nuclear Regulatory Commission ever decides to follow the law and establish a clear licensing pathway for small civilian nuclear reactors, the companies who think they can mass produce these things in a cost-effective way will, will be proven right. I mean, but he's not... He's acting like politics and economics are separate, right? And like the the level of inno current innovation is not related to political will. But what if there had just been like a massive, massive public investment into the research and development surrounding these things, including like just renewable subsidies, then maybe they'd be developed further along. So I don't know that this says it's not a, ma not a lack of political will. Although I do think that in fairness to him, the, the article that he's responding to, I, I didn't read it and I probably won't read it because this is a little bit off track already, this article, but it was just, it was basically just saying we do have all of the tools, we just need to implement them. So that may be, he's right that that's not true, but I still think you need to think about how political will relates to what's available economically. And if they are, that would not only solve the container shipping problem, but would make decarbonizing electricity much easier. And that's true even if the micro-reactors never become as cheap as today's marginal renewable electricity because we ultimately tend to move beyond these margins. The same is true for geothermal power. Even if the most optimistic scenarios here don't pan out and geothermal remains relatively expensive, a new source of baseline zero carbon electricity would solve a lot of the problems for a mostly renewable grid. By the same token, CACS, that's carbon capture and storage, doesn't ever need to be cheap enough to use at massive scale to be incredibly useful.
Even the very expensive gas and CCS system could be a cost-effective way to backstop renewables rather than engaging in massive overbuilding. Why would it backstop renewables? Aren't we talking about storing energy and smoothing out usage of carbon? Because he's talking, that's car carbon, he's using that for carbon capture and storage, right, CCS. Carbon capture and sequestration, sorry. I don't understand why that would backstop renewables. Oh, is he just saying because we're still using fossil fuels? We could, we could do that. We could CCS the... The fossil fuels we're still using, I guess, yeah. With direct air capture sucking carbon out of the air with essentially artificial trees, not only would the West pay de facto, de facto climate reparations, see Olufemi Taiwu's writing in interviews about this from last year, but we could also achieve net zero without actually solving every technical problem along the way. You could make the airlines and private jets pay an emissions tax and then use the money to capture the CO2. Of course, with all these capture schemes, there's a question of what you actually do with the carbon once it's captured. One idea is that the CO2 removed from the air could be used to manufacture jet fuel. Airlines would then burn it again and put it back out into the atmosphere. But this process would be a closed loop that wouldn't add net new greenhouse gases. That strikes me as optimistic. I mean, it's going to be costly. I guess he's saying that if, if it becomes low cost, then it could be feasible. I don't like this type of thing, though. I mean, it's just, I'm not, it's not an especially informed, well, no, it's a partly informed opinion, but like, the this stuff i just feel like when we're trying to manipulate this the environment at this finer grained level there tends to be consequences um we don't understand the environment or the ecosystem enough to just tweak it to you know fiddle with it i feel like you know direct air capture it 20 years down the line we realize that it's actually removing all the oxygen from the atmosphere or something like that you know what i mean Something like that. The case for agnosticism. People on the internet love to cheerlead for and fight about their favorite technologies. <laughs> Isn't that the truth, Matt? But everyone should try to focus on what the real trade-offs are. When towns in Maine ban new solar farms to protect the trees, there is a genuine trade-off with the development of renewable electricity. When California votes to keep Diablo Canyon open, by contrast, that does absolutely nothing to slow renewable build-out. And the idea that investments in hypothetical carbon capture technologies are preventing the deployment of already existing decarbonization technologies in the present day is just wrong. The basic reality is that some new innovations are needed to achieve net zero, especially in the context of a world that we hope will keep getting richer. These innovation paths require us essentially to keep something of an open mind. As a matter of really abstract physics, Use renewables to make hydrogen, use hydrogen for energy and storage makes energy storage and heat makes a lot of sense. As a matter of actual commercially viable technologies though, it's stacking two different unproven ideas on top of each other. Insisting that all the work on cutting edge industrial hydrogen projects be conducted with expensive green hydrogen throws sand in the gears of difficult and potentially very important work. And when you tell the world that all the problems have been solved except for political will, you unreasonably bias young people who worry about climate towards either paralysis or low eff efficacy advocacy work. What we need instead is for more young people is, who are worried about climate to find ways to contribute on the technical side to actually solving these important problems. I don't, I don't, like, <clears throat> so basically, yeah, there's, there's still some technologies that aren't that well developed. Um, not everything's available. 
renewables because they depend on the weather are naturally volatile we don't necessarily have a good way to smooth that out that isn't fossil fuels fair enough i don't more young people who are worried about climate to find ways to contribute on the technical side i mean this is this is just classic matt iglesias right this is just like depoliticizing the whole thing you know what i mean like oh just become a scientist it's like what if science isn't funded enough because of like right-wing attacks on it what if science is in thrall to like what if you're a scientist but the only jobs available are ones at fossil fuel companies low efficacy advocacy work i mean yeah that does exist but let's not underestimate the power of this is like people read scott alexander too much this is just like don't be an activist Sorry, that was a very loud gulp of my tea. I appreciate that. May not have come out very nice uh, for, for all of you. But seriously, right? Like, what if, you know, what if advocacy changes policy massively, changes our approach massively? And that, like, it has to some extent. I always find it funny as well because people, I mean, and I don't, I'm not saying Matt Iglesias is, is guilty of this direct contradiction himself but it's always like no don't do advocacy don't you know uh political activism is is pointless it doesn't work and then when you start talking about nuclear energy they're like well the only reason we don't have nuclear energy is because of all the all the left-wing political activists and it's like well okay act activism is only to blame when something goes badly that's when left-wing people become, uh, you know, the puppet masters. What if you're a scientist, but the science says that the scope and scale and severity of the climate emergency are far beyond anything the policymakers are willing to consider? Exactly. Yeah. How do you change the Overton window? Look at someone like Greta Thunberg. Like, how much has she and and the you know everyone else in that movement changed the Overton window? Should she have just like studied STEM? I mean, I don't. She probably she's probably going to. I I wouldn't be surprised if she did. <clears throat> right. Let me um. For the final bit of this stream, which is to say the next hour, I did save some papers that I didn't, um, for, for everybody who's new-ish, the start of this was messed up, I got the wrong start time, so I was a bit, uh, a bit late, and I, I, I mean, I planned not to do massively, uh, not to do massive preparation, here's one thing that I saw that could be interesting, but just to get these papers up that I'm getting up now. Pina's opinion. I'm sorry, right? I will never not find it funny that, that, that the journal, <laughs> the Proceedings for the National Academy of Sciences abbreviates to Pinas. Like, if you don't find that funny, and by the way, most academics don't find that funny, then, then you know, there's something wrong with you. And you're too boring for words, which is probably why you're an academic. Um, I think... Oh, maybe... Oh, Josh Mason. Anything by Josh Mason is good. Honestly, he could uh, he could write an article about the Kardashians keeping up with the Kardashians, and I'd definitely read it. Um, yeah, fair. Om. I yeah. I feel like it's one of those things. It's like um, everyone pretends not to find it funny because everyone wants to appear serious but if you get someone like by themselves after a drink at the pub or something and you're like 
do you not think it's funny that one of the most prominent journals is called penis um then they will definitely then like they will admit that it is funny um yeah so it, is, it is true it is true academia takes itself too seriously most academics in practice once you get down to it they actually don't just one of those classic institutional things right what's this guy about on about oh he follows me right he's definitely he definitely knows what he's talking about then how socially just are taxes on air travel and frequent flyer levies so someone was talking about this before right taxing private jets and stuff Policies to reduce air travel demand, including in the tourism sector, are urgently required as air travel's climate impact keeps growing, while low-carbon aviation remains a distant perspective. Policy options include flat rate taxes per flight, taxes on flight miles or emissions, or frequent flyer levies, yet little is known about how their distributional impacts compare. This paper examines the distributional effects of various air travel tax options for the UK, informed by an analysis of the distribution of frequent flights and associated emissions over income and other social characteristics. We find that frequent flights are even more unequally distributed than all flights, yep, and that all taxes on air travel are distributionally neutral or progressive. The most progressive option is a frequent air miles tax based on both the number of flights and emissions. At the same time, some social groups like recent migrants are relatively likely to be frequent flyers even on lower incomes. Overall, however, our results show that taxing air travel is far less regressive than taxing home energy or motor fuels. Taxes on air travel, while often portrayed as unfair in public discourse, therefore raise fewer fairness concerns than other types of carbon taxes. That are taxes on air travel often portrayed as unfair in public discourses? Who does that? It seems natural to me that they, like, rich people fly all the fucking time. And obviously, the very poorest people in the world do not fly at all. <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, yeah, this is interesting. I, this, this seems interesting. I'm going to go through the Twitter thread. We find that in the UK, that air travel accounts for a small share of emissions in the population as a whole, but a high share of emissions among frequent flyers i.e. those with two plus return flights per year, who would be subject to a frequent flyer levy. Tons of CO2. Flight emissions, yep. All households, one plus flights, two plus flights. Seven tons of CO2 a year. All households, the percentage of total emissions and the percentage of travel emissions. But high, high share of emissions among frequent flyers. Oh, that's the total of their travel. So if you fly more than twice... Then you then that flying is thirty percent of your total emissions and ninety percent almost of your total travel emissions. Whereas for most people it's under ten percent but well for everyone, sorry, not most people, but everyone on average, it's under ten percent flying of your total emissions. 
and like 25% of your travel emissions. Flights and related emissions are very unequally distributed, both in general and across income groups. The rich fly a lot more, and the inequality is even worse if only flights that would be subject to a frequent flyer levy are considered. Jeez, look at that. GHG all flights, GHG frequent flights. So literally, I mean, you're looking at, look at that. It's flat. Here, that's so unequal, the distribution of flights. That, that's one of the most unequal Lorenz curves I've ever seen for anything. That's quite remarkable. Yeah, so the top decile emits five tons of CO2 per year. Almost. We compared different models of air travel taxation. They are all clearly progressive with higher burdens for the richer groups. Both taxing emissions and taxing frequent flights are even more progressive than just taxing flights, as currently in the UK. Oh, okay. Frequent air miles tax. Frequent flyer levy. Flight emissions tax. Tax burdens, so... That's frequent air mile tax. That's the frequent flyer levy. That's just air pass. That's the existing one, that light grey. And then that's a flight emissions tax. So those two are kind of similar, but then you've got the frequent air miles tax. Looks good. Very progressive. The most progressive air travel taxation model is one that penalizes frequent flights while also taking into account flight emissions, penalizing longer flights. Oh, that's just the same graph, sorry, yeah. How practical is this frequent flyer tax though, right? Like, to what, to what extent... I'm sorry, I couldn't help but notice that. Tories considering benefits to cut to pay for tax giveaway. Oh my God. Right. Let's just focus on this before I tear my own fucking eyes out at the Tories. Um, right. Note that there is a slight uptick in the cost burden of air travel taxes in the lowest income decile. We looked into detail and found that it because it's because the lowest income decile is weird. It concludes some better off people with income from things like annuities and pensions. Okay, yeah. We compared a carbon tax on air travel with carbon tax on all emissions or other sectors, home energy, motor fuel. A carbon tax on air travel is the only one with a progressive distributional impact, even before redistributing the re revenue. It would hurt the rich the most. We then looked at who frequent flyers are in the UK. They're about 30% of the population, while 51% doesn't fly in a typical year, and 19% fly just once. Wow. I would have thought... That's amazing. I actually... God, Jesus, this just shows you how fucking middle class I am. I didn't realise most people didn't fly in a typical year. Literally everyone I know flies multiple times a year. Or at least once. At least once. Actually, yeah, maybe not multiple, but like at least once. And that's just in the UK. We find that the groups with the highest rates of frequent flying over 40% over 40% are those in the top income quintile, the university educated, recent migrants, non-British white people, people with close relatives abroad, and residents of London and Northern Ireland. Okay, so I fit like some of those. 
I mean, I'm not in the top income quintile. Oh, quintile. No. Actually, maybe. This sort of shows that there are other important driver drivers of air travel besides income. Interesting. You either are people who live on cents a day. In a, yeah, not, not, not so much in, in the UK. You haven't flown for like six years. Wow, I've never been on a train. I've only flown once in my life. The rich don't ride passenger air at all. They use charter flights if and when they use aircraft they themselves don't own. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if this policy applies to, like, private jets. It seems like it wouldn't because I feel like it's a consumption tax of sorts that would apply at the point of purchase. Yeah, the UK has homeless people, sure, but I... I, a few cents a day. I feel like most homeless people survive on slightly more than that. I mean, I'm not saying they're not in poverty. An Apache attack helicopter gets like 0.2 miles per gallon. Yeah, I mean, the military, that's a whole thing, isn't it? Um, this sort of shows that there are other point, yeah, drivers of air travel besides income. People in peripheral regions and with migration background and dispersed social networks tend to fly more, which is what you just said, Ninpin. Nin, nin. This means they are more likely to fly more even when on low incomes. See graph, yeah. Okay, so what's this saying? Migration generation, fourth plus first. Oh, yeah, okay, so you can see. But yeah, okay. So they're like... So that, that be being a migrant basically puts you up like three income quintiles in terms of your flying. A recent migrant. A, a recent first generation migrant. <clears throat> to illustrate this, we modeled two extreme cases. A recent migrant with a few with few local friends and family abroad versus an entirely native local based person. The migrant has a 40% probability of being a frequent flyer, even on low income, more than even the richest of locals. Oh, it's more. That doesn't seem to map onto the... previous graph, but it doesn't matter. So there are some minor equity concerns for certain groups such as migrants and residents of peripheral areas. But these groups are small and the issue can probably be addressed with ad hoc measures, discounts and exemptions. The big picture is that air travel taxes are probably the most socially progressive environmental tax you can think of. So when some argue that air travel taxes are socially unfair, chances are they really oppose them for some other less presentable reason. Okay. That's really interesting. Right, so this undercuts, like, one of the main problems with carbon taxes, right, which is the, the lack of political buy-in. Um, and, and the regressivity. It doesn't address... I'm going to follow this, dude. It doesn't address the low response. So they don't actually look at the effect on emissions. Let me just... Um, according to... Uh, books, books and Mattioli. 2020 is it 2022 um and a 
uh, progressive air travel tax will will not have the problem of regressivity and therefore political backlash as most carbon taxes and therefore is worth pursuing um, however they they do not estimate the effect on emissions as with Taylor above um, and air travel is only one albeit important component of carbon emissions yeah all right so so we're developing our opinion well i'm developing my opinion and my opinion has been updated to say that i definitely want some kind of tax on air travel even if i'm not sold on carbon taxes in general Yeah. Um. So, yeah, so there's, okay, this, have I already, let me uh, close that. Lest we get confused. Penis, penis opinion, penis opinion. Where's this? How long is this? Can we read this? We can read this. We can read it. I'll read it. I don't mind. That one looks good. That one looks good. Wait, what's this other? The effect of... In order to achieve the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement, the world must reach net zero carbon emissions around mid-century, which calls for an entirely new energy system. Carbon pricing in the shape of taxes or emissions trading schemes is often seen as the main or only necessary climate policy instrument. Based on theoretical expectations that this would promote innovation and diffusion of the new technologies necessary for full decarbonisation. Here, we review the empirical knowledge available in academic ex-post analyses of the effectiveness of existing, comparatively high price carbon pricing schemes in the European Union, New Zealand, British Columbia and the Nordic countries. Some articles find short-term operational effects, especially fuel switching in existing assets, but no article finds mentionable effects on technological change. Critically, all articles examining the effects on zero carbon investment found that existing carbon pricing scheme schemes have had no effect at all. We conclude that the effectiveness of carbon pricing in stimulating innovation and zero carbon investment remains a theoretical argument. So far, there is no empirical evidence of its effectiveness in promoting the technological change necessary for full decarbonisation. Fuck. So what, industry... It doesn't, it doesn't promote innovation in the same way as renewables. I'm not going to read through this entire paper here, because, like, it's long, but I'll just, I'll just make a note of it. Let's we can put it here where we're talking so uh Lilistam et al two thousand and twenty. 
an interesting name. Where's that from? Is it like, is it Dutch? 20. It does not affect innovation. Yeah, uh, you see Google trying to correct my grammar, then realizing I was right. Fuck off. Um, find that it does not affect innovation in energy, whereas renewable subsidies definitely seem to. In fact, I can go back to see. Um, that one that Noah Smith referenced. Um, 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 this one. Well, let's be more precise. Let's say solar. See, uh, let me just Wait, where did it go? Oh, it's here. Um, not so definitely. Let's not be too, too sure about that. Again, that one. Um, that is really interesting, though. That's very interesting. Um, ha, huh. I think I already answered that question from you. <laughs> the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement have already been exceeded. Is that the case? All right, all right. Get this, uh... Get this crap out of the out of the way so that people can see. Carbon pricing is often presented as the primary policy approach to address climate change. We challenge this position and offer sustainability transition policy as an alternative. Carbon pricing has weaknesses with regard to five central dimensions. Problem, problem framing and solution orientation, policy priorities, innovation approach, contextual considerations, and politics. In order to address the urgency of climate change and to achieve deep decarbonisation, climate policy responses need to move beyond market failure reasoning and focus on fundamental changes in existing socio-technical systems such as energy, mobility, food and industrial production. The core principles of STP can help tackle this challenge. Realizing deep decarbonization at the pace necessary to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change has emerged as a pressing challenge for policymakers. As a result, the debate about appropriate policy responses has intensified. Many experts and societal actors see carbon pricing as the primary way forward. Some even use it to argue against other policies such as fuel efficiency standards. Viewed as the most efficient approach to cut greenhouse gas emissions, carbon pricing incentivizes actors to seek the lowest cost abatement options for their specific circumstances. Consequently, many economists argue that carbon pricing should be the cornerstone of a climate policy response. We question this reasoning. Carbon pricing faces five major issues that limit its use for accelerating deep decarbonization. First, carbon pricing frames climate change as a market failure rather than as a fundamental system problem. 
Second, it places particular weight on efficiency as opposed to effectiveness. Third, it tends to stimulate the optimization of existing systems rather than transformation. Fourth, it suggests a universal instead of context-sensitive approach. Fifth, it fails to reflect political realities. Oh, Nadia, you were. Uh, that's like a prediction, right? Probably a credible one, to be fair. But yeah, so they're not now, but they will be even if we literally um, <clears throat> stop polluting. Given these limitations, we propose an alternative approach that targets fundamental transformations of existing socio technical systems, such as energy, mobility, or food. STP entails a mix of contextually and politically sensitive policies that simultaneously drive low carbon innovation and the decline of fossil fuels. Market failure versus systemic problem. System problem. The underlying rationale for carbon pricing is appealing in its simplicity. Global uh, greenhouse gas emissions are viewed as a negative externality because the social costs flowing from climate change impacts are not reflected in the market price of carbon intensive goods and services. Climate change is framed as the consequence of a market failure that can be corrected by placing a price on carbon so that actors also pay for the social cost of their carbon intensive activities and reduce their demand for such goods and services. Framing the climate challenge as a market failure, however, fails to seriously appreciate its scope and depth. Indeed, the climate challenge has been referred to as a grand challenge or super wicked problem that has thus far resisted traditional policy approaches. We argue climate change can be more appropriately understood as a system problem. Core societal functions, such as heating or mobility, are met through largely and deeply entrenched socio-technical systems made up of interconnected technologies, infrastructures, regulations, business models and lifestyles. Over many decades, these systems have become increasingly locked into the combustion of fossil fuels and the associated release of greenhouse gas emissions. Consider, for instance, how the design of cities has developed alongside the diffusion of gasoline-powered personal automobile, how norms about comfort and attire have become entwined with the energy-intensive indoor temperature re regulation, and how important political and economic interests have become entrenched with fossil fuel-based resource development or electricity provision. Addressing the climate challenge, therefore, involves fundamental changes to existing systems, referred to as sustainability transitions. These transitions entail profound and interdependent adjustments in socio-technical systems that cannot be reduced to a single driver, such as shifts in relative market prices. In mobility, for example, a low-carbon transition might encompass interacting developments around new vehicle technologies, infrastructures, business models and regulation, but also changes in city planning and lifestyles. The market failure framing fails to appreciate the broad scope of the climate challenge and the sweep of system elements that must undergo change, and so the resulting solution orientation is far from sufficient. I agree with this. That This is what I have in mind when I talk about, when I think about, like, a Green New Deal, right? So, yeah. Um... You know, autonomous electric cars. Okay, maybe less so, but yeah, I, I, yeah. For some, for some things, right? Like, you need electric vehicles. Let's say electric vehicles instead of electric cars, like electric trucks and things like that, for transporting goods and stuff. Vehicle charging stations and high-speed rail. Right? Yeah, you need alternative forms of transport. Mobility as a service and intermodal transport. Uh, I actually don't know what that means. Emissions performance standards. Um, changes in city planning, reduced urban sprawl, lifestyles, telework, and local vacation. Yeah, like, so yeah, some, we need to change our lifestyles essentially and change our cities. I mean, they're actually being quite reserved here. You know, they're not like being radical, like, fuck, like, ban car, like, pedestrianized city centers ban cars, right? Like, less meat, like, get rid of meat from a lot of people's diets. You know what I mean? Like, less use of concrete, different use of like, 
how we build buildings and things like that you need to make really big changes that you know are multifaceted i don't think any one thing is gonna gonna solve the problem Carbon pricing strategies are often considered to be the most efficient means of reducing carbon emissions. They do so by affording heterogeneous polluters, firms from different industries, for example, the flexibility of responding to the carbon price signal in a least cost fashion, selecting the level of abatement and specific abatement options that are most cost effective for their circumstances. Abatement options are then adopted in a stepwise manner in line with the carbon price. Under a series of assumptions, economic rationality, perfect information, credibility and broad coverage, the result is that a given level of abatement is met at least global cost, which no other instrument than pricing is able to realise. Well, yeah. Wait, which reference is this? Carbon pricing and climate policy. And what's for? Stiglitz, carbon prices, the climate casino. Yeah, I mean Nordhaus talking shit. As per, but you know, these, these models like, <laughs> you know, I'm not, these assumptions, the, the assumptions aren't true, the model isn't true. Like, I'm not going to fucking use it for policy. We question whether efficiency should be an overriding priority of climate policy. If we are to limit global warming to less than 1.5 degrees centigrade, there is little time remaining to reach carbon neutrality. Oh, the IPCC, yeah. Yeah, the negative impacts of climate change are already undermining human prosperity and the cost of inaction will escalate the longer we wait. Despite the urgency of the problem, carbon pricing places considerable weight on seeking low-hanging fruit and, according to Pat and Lillistam, fails to appreciate that we must eventually pick all of the apples on the tree. Hmm. Is that true? What? So, the shifts... Carbon pricing will cause firms to shift to, like, easy-ish technological... Um, solutions or, or you know renewable solutions uh, Pat and Lillistam is that the paper we literally just oh the case against pr carbon prices ooh hello that's one for another day then we might have to have a Lillistam because um, the other paper was from them as well we might have to have like a, a Lillistam uh, bonanza because this dude seems like this dude seems like he's on it. Is that him? Legend. Actually, I think that might be Anthony Pat. There's Lillistan. Okay. Anyway, I'm <laughs> getting distracted by pictures of of my heroes, my new heroes. Um. Yeah. As of 2019, existing carbon pricing schemes only cover around 20% of global emissions, and more than two-thirds of these have prices below 20 United States dollars per tonne of CO2 equivalent. This is far too low to be effective, and increasing coverage and prices present serious challenges, which we return to below. Efficiency considerations must, therefore, be tempered by an immediate need to realise carbon neutrality through whatever means actually work. This implies moving beyond lowest cost solutions to stimulate a diversity of mitigation options, including those that have considerable immediate reduction potential, such as phasing out coal or, restore coal or restoring peatlands, and others that may fundamentally transform systems in the long term, mobility as a service or bio-based materials. Right, okay, they keep mentioning this mobility as a service. What does it mean? Oh, mass transit. Yes, a unified transit. 
system. Yes. Mobility as a service. That sounds fucking sick. Like, anyway, but then also potentially good for the for the environment if it's all low cost, you know, uh, low carbon cost, I should say. Salt or pepper? Mate, what kind of fucking question is that? Man puts salt and pepper on both on all, all food. But probably salt, if I had to choose. Because salt's in fucking everything, isn't it? Like, you can do without pepper, is the truth. Without salt, then, you know, a lot of things we just wouldn't taste of anything. Optimizing versus transforming. Let's continue. By increasing the relative price of carbon-intensive goods and services, carbon pricing is understood to incentivize the adoption of existing low-carbon technologies and, indirectly, stimulate the development of low-carbon innovations. Investments in low-carbon alternatives are not only encouraged through present carbon prices, but also through expectations about future carbon price increases. Hmm, interesting. It is, however, unclear how such strong innovation effects actually are and whether carbon pricing can generate more than incremental changes. Vinarim to Vinarim and Melling, for instance, review this record of several prominent price carbon pricing strategies and find that they have to date helped realize limited opportunities for innovation and system wise transformation. Rather, current trajectories and emissions reductions deviate little from business as usual scenarios, even in the case of Sweden's $140 carbon price for the transport and building sectors. I thought Sweden's was only for the transport sector. Or well, that paper that I, that I looked at only looked at the transport sector, I'm pretty sure. But it's the building sector as well. Others have observed similar patterns. This suggests that in practice, carbon pricing strategies tend to promote the optimization of established business models and technologies, but neglect more fundamental system change necessary for deep decarbonization. While optimization remains important, it does little to confront carbon lock-in, encourage radical innovation, or avoid dead-end paths. It's an interesting turn, carbon lock-in, because people use... People use lock-in to refer to things like um, social media platforms, don't they, right? Like, they, they'll, they'll, they'll talk about, like, lock-in to Facebook or something like that, and that means that, you know, once everybody's on it, it's difficult for everybody to get off it without, like, a massive kind of shock to how people do things. And it's a really good way to think about carbon, actually, now that I've read that. I think like that carbon lock-in, it's like tweaking, you know. Imagine if you, you know, you did like a social media tax. Do you think that would that would reduce like social media lock-in? I don't I don't think so. If you tax like Facebook. You need bigger changes. Yeah. Indeed, research indicates that investments in long-lived carbon-intensive infrastructures such as natural gas are still ongoing even in jurisdictions with prominent carbon pricing regimes. Retiring these investments prematurely in order to align with deep decarbonization pathways will be politically difficult and costly due to compensation for effective firms and communities. In contrast, we argue that incremental changes alone is insufficient to pursue low carbon pathways at the required pace. Established systems are characterized by deep lock-ins, such as large sunk, sunk costs in infrastructure and cultural conventions underpinning user practices that encourage movement along established development trajectories. Deliberately accelerating transitions, therefore, involves weakening lock-ins, removing fossil fuel subsidies and banning carbon intensive technologies, yes, and supporting system building for low carbon alternatives, stimulating new innovations, business models and markets. This is pretty, um, I'm finding this quite compelling. I think it kind of crystallized something for me, which I think, you know, 
the the models that economists use when they talk about carbon pricing tend to assume that prices in general are something that people respond to quite a lot and prices are basically how resources are allocated for you know mainstream economic models and i think i've always thought i've thought for a long time and people like nathan tankus for example uh, always post about this um it's a po it's a post keynesian idea prices actually aren't as important as all that because what you have is that people are locked into a certain lifestyle and you know they have their habits uh in a sort of individual psychological level they have the existing institutions that are available for them to use um that they rely on and they have their commitments to you know their job for example or to other people you know to travel and see their family and things like that and they're not they're not going to shift those things in response to relatively small changes in price right they're just not going to shift them that's why you've still got people using carbon um still still got people using cars a lot in europe even though we have very high we have very high taxes on on petrol and people just don't shift their behavior that much especially if it's something as crucial as like energy especially in that case yeah okay maybe if like the price of mars bars doubles then people are going to shift to sneak snickers maybe if the price of apples doubles people in in are going to shift to bananas yeah sure those kind of consumption goods where there are lots of alternatives available where you can switch easily maybe yeah but when you're talking about these things that are basically needs that are fundamental to people's lifestyles you're not going to get these kinds of shifts and so the only answer if you were within that paradigm would be to say yeah okay look the price basically the price elasticity of demand is very low but we that that means you have to increase it by a lot but then when you increase it by a lot what you're doing is you're basically just destroying somebody's way of life like like with you know this is why people protest against carbon taxes uh, or you know uh, fuel taxes and energy taxes of various types because you're saying okay well now that entire lifestyle that you've been living and you're used to and which we expect you to to live really because we expect you to go to work and, and all the rest of it and provide for your family now that lifestyle that you're living is no longer possible because we've just ramped up the cost of it massively and then you get political opposition for a very good reason now one of the things that think that renewable subsidies but also what they're calling a system change one of the things that does is that it provides people with alternatives and it provides people with an alternative uh, way of meeting their needs and their obligations without upsetting um, their existing lifestyle to such to such a, a massive extent so I, this is why i don't think carbon taxes are are that great even if i support them for instance i think in the case of air travel i would agree with them i do think you know all things considered maybe there should be one on on uh petroleum gasoline petrol whatever you want to call it it's not that i disagree with these things but i do think that their effects are relatively small politically they're a very hard sell there doesn't seem to be evidence that they really encourage new innovation into alternatives why not just invest in the alternatives directly and politically that's much that's a much better sell you know let's build a better future let's build better city centers for example not pollution and cars fucking everywhere crashing mowing people down beeping making loads of noise taking up all the space causing london to be the equivalent of smoking five cigarettes a day I mean that's yeah that's 65 in total for me no not really but yeah so um yeah that's 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 basically that's kind of crystallized my my opinion on this matter um 
let's finish this let's finish this paper there um so yeah universal versus context sensitive policy Carbon pricing strategies tend to be predicated on the notion that eventually all emissions are covered so that all prices will be corrected such that no economic decision would escape carbon pricing's regulatory impact. This means that all jurisdictions and economic sectors should be included, ideally with uniform price signals. In the absence of uniform pricing, there is a risk that some nations will free ride on the efforts of others and that firms will... Pardon me, sorry. Well, firms will relocate to places with lower or no carbon prices, i.e. carbon leakage. Three issues confront this universal approach. First, the required levels of coordination and cooperation are unrealistic, as carbon pricing encounters a fragmented international climate policy landscape. In the absence of a global sovereign, and considering the great diversity of national circumstances, where countries have different responsibilities for generating the problem, vulnerabilities and resources to adapt and support mitigation and also China wants to take over the world remember that from Noah Smith's article um, cooperation or convergence among emission pricing frameworks remain elusive second a universal approach will require well-functioning institutional structures and high levels of regulatory competencies and monitoring systems which do not exist everywhere that is so true like you it's so easy to, and I, you know, I don't want this to come across as any kind of condescension, but it's so easy to overestimate the institutions and, you know, information gathering facilities that exist in poorer countries. Like, it, so they just can't, like, they can't regulate in the same way that richer countries can. It's just, it's just not, the capacity is just not there. What they actually can do better is adopt new technologies, right? This like the the it's actually more possible for that to happen and for them to build infrastructure, even if it's like you know, for it's the first um say it's like a, an extreme case, right? You're building like the first set of um inter town or intercity um transportation networks then they can skip that they can skip like when it was motorways and just roads and move to like trains and um you know inside cities pedestrianized areas with cycling paths and trams and things like that that's much more feasible to get them to regulate industry to produce less carbon is is harder Third, carbon pricing strategies tend to ignore that policies need to be tailored to local and or sectoral contexts in order to address specific sources of lock-in and opportunities for innovation. Carbon pricing functions well in sectors such as electricity with large fixed point sources where alternative technologies are available and polluters cannot easily relocate. It's more difficult to implement in agro-food, transport and heavy industry. Agrofood systems are characterized by manifold commodities, dispersed production, millions of farmers in highly variable contexts, soil conditions, climate, local communities, and deeply entrenched cultural conventions, such as tastes and dietary habits, which all make it extremely difficult to assess the level of an effective carbon price and implement this throughout the system. Existing and proposed carbon prices also faced problems in transport, often translating into pennies on the gallon. Such effects fall short of inducing the needed lifestyle changes or even being distinguished from standard oil market fluctuations. This highlights the major differences between systems across sectors, scales and locations. The geophysical resources, infrastructures, actor networks and availability of low carbon alternatives diverge markedly from one system to another. Thus, the specific package of policy solutions, performance standards versus technology mandates, will also vary accordingly. And given the above mentioned challenges facing a uniform global response, climate policy will be defined by layered and interacting efforts within and across different contexts.
Corn isn't even vegan. That's one thing that annoys me about corn. You're very off topic, chat. Well, not very off topic. You're slightly off topic. <laughs> but it's not even vegan. So I haven't tried it. Political realities. A transparent price signal is often considered to be a core benefit of carbon pricing strategies as it conveys information about the external costs of greenhouse gases to consumers and firms, allowing them to internalize these costs in their decision making. Market forces in this view act as the principal drivers of change. The primary role of government is to set the right price and leave the rest to the market. This, however, fails to acknowledge the substantial contestation around climate policy and the political nature of markets. Carbon pricing strategies are not politically neutral, but normative endeavours, i.e. centred on what constitutes appropriate solutions and why, with major distributional consequences, i.e. who will win or lose. As with the majority of climate policies, they threaten the endowments of incumbent firms and industries. Many of these actors have responded by using their considerable influence to resist and weaken the stringency of carbon pricing measures, such as the European Union's emissions trading system. Carbon pricing has also attracted political resistance among the broader public, as it is perceived to challenge long-standing practices and livelihoods, such as car-based and suburban lifestyles. Literally, I was just talking for so long. <laughs> for fuck's sake. Um, um, uh, yeah, so... Okay, let, let, me read, let me read out that paragraph again, because it's actually a really good paragraph, and I was, I was ranting about how good it was. Do you rant about good things? I don't know. Maybe. In this way, we argue for more explicit engagement with the politics of climate policy. While politics tends to be regarded as a barrier to climate action, research suggests that well-designed climate policies can also generate self-reinforcing political dynamics that can set in motion transformative processes. Sequences of policies designed to strengthen supportive coalitions with an interest in low-carbon alternatives, such as networks of innovators, communities, and civil society actors, may create conditions for political victories and more ambitious climate policies over subsequent rounds of political debate and policy making. So this is a framing that I think a lot of economists, including myself, are guilty of, and I will have done it on this stream where you say, oh, you know, carbon taxes, they'd be great in theory if we could actually implement one, but, you know, politically, they're not really good. There's too much um opposition from the fossil fuel industry people don't like them because they you know it costs them money they're regressive so therefore we've got to do renewable subsidies for instance but i think 
the framing while that's kind of correct in its analysis the framing of politics as opposed to like good economics i think it is is wrong headed because if you think about really transforming the economy to be a low carbon economy you know that can be politically actually a very valuable thing that can be a politically a very motivating vision to set forward and i do think opinion polls are a bit crap i don't really like them using them but i do remember when the green new deal was first proposed you know polling seemed to show that republicans um and people in rural areas and people in urban areas they all kind of agreed with the with the vision put forward by something like the green new deal you know let's build this better world so that once you get that and you 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 create those things and people buy into them and then people get used to them then people are you know they're going to support you in in the expansion of these things and politics and economics can work together sustainable transition policy right almost almost there Given the limitations of a climate response based on carbon pricing strategies, we offer Sustainability Transition Policy, or STB, as an alternative. Th framing the climate challenge as a system problem, STP emphasizes the rapid and effective reduction of system emissions, system transformation and radical innovation, the development of context-sensitive responses, and the inherent political nature of decarbonization. Neoclassical economics, innovation studies, evolutionary economics. Right, okay. Climate change is market failure versus climate change as system problem. Reduce climate emissions while keeping the economy wide costs as a uh, minimum. Drive down emissions as quickly as possible. Incremental change, transformative change. Carbon pricing for all jurisdictions and sectors. Policies should be adapted to local and sectoral contexts. Revenue recycling to deal with political realities. Creation of alternatives and form formation of supportive coalitions. Okay, yeah. So that's basically just what we've been saying. Yeah. Indeed, STP is predicated on the notion that a low carbon transition will involve multiple and co-evolving social and technological changes. Many levers will need to be pulled and deliberately aligned to realize change. From supporting emerging innovations and decommissioning existing technologies or infrastructure to building coalitions of actors and interests to redesigning market rules and planning processes to legitimizing new practices and related social norms. Carbon pricing can be part of this policy mix, but should not be seen as the single best or primary instrument. Embracing these varied levers, STP is not about a single policy intervention, but a coherent sequence of policy decisions and associated changes in business technologies, business models and practices that drive, together drive potential decarbonisation pathways for socio-technical systems under conditions of complexity and uncertainty. Broadly, STP targets innovation and decline. That is, it includes policies to support low carbon innovations and their upscaling, as well as policies to exert pressure on carbon intensive products, technologies and practices to eventually stimulate their decline. Innovation is important to continually develop alternatives. Decline is crucial to break up lock-ins and to signal to producers and consumers that fundamental changes are necessary. Okay, yeah. So you you got the managed decline, both the decline in carbon and, and the uptick in alternatives. STP also acknowledges that transitions develop through different phases, from early takeoff to later acceleration and consolidation. Early stage innovations, for example, need experimentation in protected spaces, i.e. niches, which shield their development from harsh competitive pressures. Accelerating low carbon innovation requires diffusion and deployment policies that aim at embedding and scaling niche experiments beyond their initial boundaries, targeting, for example, the creation of new networks, entrepreneurial activities and standards, as well as education and training. There is a similar phase logic with respect to decline. Destabilization and weakening lock-in mechanisms can create windows of opportunity for new practices, business models and technologies. 
Policy instruments for destabilization include divestment strategies, removal of fossil fuel subsidies, carbon pricing, or stronger environmental standards. To accelerate decline, policy also has a role to play in implementing phase-outs. Otherwise, problematic technologies can persist for decades. Phase-out policies have, for instance, target targeted incandescent light bulbs, coal-fired power, and nuclear power. I'm not sure if they're implying nuclear power is bad there, or if they just if it's just a, just an example descriptively. STP also appreciates the central place of policy and politics. Climate or transition policies are layered on top of inst existing institutional frameworks, which means that policy formulation and implementation is a complex, messy, and often piecemeal process that resists optimal solutions. And in the face of political conflict and resistance, it is crucial to generate societal and business support for climate policy responses. This is why stimulating low carbon innovations and associated supportive coalitions with a material interest in these innovations is of critical importance. Over subsequent cycles of policy making, climate policies, low carbon innovations and supportive coalitions can mutually reinforce one another to drive low carbon pathways. In general, STP calls for new modes of governance that are better suited to the context of transformative change. Such an approach recognises the importance of continually adapting specific measures in response to new developments and learning, but also acknowledges that the overarching directionality of policy, commitments, resources, etc. should be stabilised in order to drive a transition. In summary, the dominant logic of contemporary climate policy, in which carbon pricing is the central policy response, is deeply flawed. Given the aforementioned shortcomings, carbon pricing should not be the primary policy strategy to combat climate change. Instead, carbon pricing should be used as part of a policy mix that promotes innovation and decline, accounts for political dynamics, varies between sectors and over time, and aims at profound system change. Okay. So... I liked this paper. It's probably the best thing we've read on this stream. And to be honest, it might be the best thing I've read on the topic. It's just very comprehensive. Rosen, Bloom, Air Towel, 2020. Whoop. Is the best summary of the various issues with carbon taxes is a very based paper hello divine hello sign for fine sign fine belly it is a very very based paper um so yeah it casts uh casts climate change as a systems failure and <clears throat> details how carbon lock-in prevents adjustments to um, carbon use in response to taxes in the way in the classical models would predict uh based isn't the new savage no based is just good savage is more like um brutal like like it, savage is is a criticism right if you're being savage i get no yeah yeah it's, it's a little bit similar it's a little bit similar peter Um, typically, um, price responses are relatively small from, from consumers as well as being progressive and it's not, not clear carbon pricing leads to pro environmental innovation let's call it either um 
in addition what they call a Okay, a uh, sustainability transition policy could build a better alternative through redesigning transport, cities, lifestyles. Miles. consumption that's already in lifestyles actually and and work um and work uh this would build a political coalition in which could create um rolling change in a way change which contrasts to unpopular um, and regressive carbon taxes carbon taxation I hope that's a decent summary of the paper right this this is this is starting to come along this is not as good as the cost of living crisis document yet but it's it's coming along it's coming along um daniela gabor has been talking a lot about green de-risking have you been following this uh yeah ned i um i find i find uh daniela um extremely interesting sometimes i feel like it goes a bit over my head um i just like there's a lot of finance i actually need to speak to daniela on on this um on on a stream um i could maybe speak to her about that but i like it's just she, she just knows so much about finance and sometimes the jargon and the the ideas just i've read some of her papers and i come out and i'm just like yeah green finance is good like i don't actually know it i don't actually like understand properly um yeah but i know I, I i i know Daniela, kind of, so I can, um, it would be good to talk to her, for sure. Um, all right, everyone. So we've got more, but let's not do it because um, we're all tired. And yeah, there's still 91 of you, but when the, when the viewers start to drop off, I can see that people are just getting like tired. It's a lot, but basically... What have we found today? What have we let's sum up. Let's 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 sum sum right up. And what we found today, it seems that carbon taxes have quite small effects on consumption. Price elasticities are typically very low. People don't respond to prices um that much within, you know, um carbon in intensive areas like transportation it doesn't seem that businesses respond with better innovation either um and to top it all off they're extremely difficult politically uh both because people and also very powerful interests are opposed to them and um yeah so they're not great however the air Taxes on air travel could be progressive. That might actually be a really good thing to do. And, um, you know, I'm not against carbon taxes as such. I just, I just think politically it's much better to go with, like, transformative policies. Um, and I think these transformative policies are much more proven, especially renewable subsidies, by the way. They're, they're much more proven than carbon taxes. So in the face-off, I do think renewable subsidies won. I have to say, the effects of carbon taxes just seem to be really small and unproven. And we, and we already knew going into this that the empirical base behind carbon taxes was, was not great. So yeah, there you go. I'm going to go and make myself dinner. I don't know about all of you, but um, thanks so much for joining, and I'll see you all next time. I don't know why I said that so weirdly. Anyway, bye.